Oh, RTA. All right. Well, dude, what's what up, YouTube? Go? How's it going? We're talking RTA today. Yes, the missing episode PH. Uh, I mean, I couldn't believe it when we went back and looked at 52 Weeks of Reefing and there isn't a PH episode. Nothing about PH. That is how far this has come <laughs> since 2015. If you're wondering about PH, why I wasn't there, it's because nobody was talking about it. And a total different world Completely. today. You know, back then we were thinking 7.8 to 8.3 is uh, an okay range. All right, before we get to today's uh, topic, uh, uh, there's another missing episode that's gonna come up. I wanna tell you about you don't even know yet. I don't know yet. All right, so it's actually the missing uh, disease. So we oh, kind of floated yeah. over in week 52 or 51, I think it was, yeah. you know, quarantine, disease, like really, Slipped it right in, slipped right out, it was over. Yeah. Uh, this time, Elliot actually said that he will join us uh, and tell us, and we're thinking about breaking it down. And uh, Elliot at Marine Collectors, uh, he's thinking about like everything we know about Ick, everything we know about uh, 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 Brooke, everything you know about Velvet. Your anemia uh, and flukes. And flukes. And we'll keep going if you guys are interested. So uh, I don't know when that's going to happen, but I just want to give a shout out. You should expect to see that as part of this live series. We're also thinking about some short ones that come. He's going to fly out here and help us. Uh, also, Elliot is actually hiring. So if you want, if you live in the LA area and you want to get into the industry and help Elliot, man, uh, <laughs> hit up marinecollectors.com. All right, so uh, core belief here. So we start all these off, the missing episode, PH, RTA. Yes. Core belief, 7.8 is a bad move, embracing reef tank acidification, and higher than that, is the right move. RTA, reef tank acidification. I don't know if it's ever been coined until like right now, uh, but you know, if our reef tanks are a slice of the ocean, which everybody says they are and they absolutely are, then the same concerns for the ocean we should have for our reef tanks. All right, so some people are like, no, 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 7.8 to 8.3 is just fine. All right, if you watch today, you will come out today and say, Maybe I'm not as sure of that statement as I was before because I'm saying that right now. Yeah, I don't know how many times, or you can even go look right now what's a good pH for your reef tank, and you'll most likely see 7.8 to 8.3. So this is what you're gonna see today. Uh, you're gonna see what matters most. You're going to see, uh, I promised last time that we'd uh, share some of the uh, studies and some of the other thought leaders. So we got stuff out of here from the Great Barrier Marie, uh, Reef Marine Park Authority, the Woods Hole Oceanograph uh, Ocean Graphics uh, Institution, the National Academy, Academy of Sciences. We got uh, all the hard lessons. We got solutions. Who those solutions are actually good for? Some upsides, some downsides. Yeah, pros and cons. I saw here actually there was one comment in here uh, early on which says, "Haven't been enjoying this long format videos. <laughs> Tough to take away." Away, uh, from them and the little short stru uh, structured concept. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, listening to us for an hour on this thing, man, not everybody's got the time. You will see this stuff uh, uh, starting uh, on Monday. Yeah, we've uh, the pH conversation. We've seen a bunch of different conversations. We're starting a new series called Problem Solvers. Yes. We're also starting a new series, kind of like uh, on uh, I wish uh, I would have known at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I wish somebody had asked this question before. So we're going to start some of those things down, uh, and they'll be a little bit more fast, uh, fast following your typical 10 to 20 minute videos where you can really get the meat of it yeah. really quick. And in a lot of those, pH uh, comes up time and time and time and time, time, and time again. Time again. This is for man. You really want to know it all. You want to be on the forefront. Uh, man, this is where it's at. So, all right. So what matters most? What matters most in pH? And the first one we got here is in the reef tank, it's called pH. In the ocean, it's called ocean acidification or OA. And this is directly 100% tied to pH. pH and free hydrogen ions. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're going to get to some of the data here that... Uh, smart people outside of the reefing hobby have been following along in our natural ocean and uh, you know kind of apply that to the the reef tank if you google uh, the ph uh, uh, and, um, ocean reefs you'll get zero results 
The only mm. results you'll get are related to ocean, the acidification, acidification of the ocean, yep. uh, or OA for short. Uh, so it's definitely worth the read too, especially when uh, you know we're going to break down some of the science behind the uh, CO2 and carbonic acids and hydrogens and things like that. You see our little models here on the table. We're going to get to, uh, but it is one you know kind of one when you get that chemistry concept and then you go read those articles, uh, just completely eye opening. You know, it's interesting because like there's a lot of stuff that you you know debatable about the environment and like whether or not mm. humankind is doing something to the earth. You can debate the stuff all. Who cares? Yeah. Uh, you know, like there is a there's a right side and wrong side of some of these things, but like it's not the point. And like, is it global warming? Is it man-made? Who knows? But here's one thing. There's one thing for sure. Uh, we are releasing more carbon dioxide in the industrial age into the atmosphere mm -hmm. than ever before, and the ocean is a giant sink for carbon dioxide. Sucking it up. It's absolutely lowering the pH. You won't find a single scientist on the planet that doesn't agree with that. <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. That one is indisputable, 100%. Embrace it. It exists. It's real. You can't find anybody that will say anything different. Yep. We're releasing more. We're driving cars we didn't used to drive. We're doing all kinds of different things all over the planet. The ocean sinks all that carbon dioxide up, turns it into carbonic acid. Acidity goes up. pH goes down. All right. So what matters most also, next one, is the pH is a measurement and not the issue. Right? Okay. So in the uh, in the ocean, the issue is ocean acidification. You know, the primary measurement of that would be pH. Right. In the aquarium, we treat it the opposite for some reason. Yeah. So uh, instead of saying you know instead of saying this RTA ter term, the reef tank acidification, which is what the last bullet just said in the in the reef tank, it's called pH, and the ocean is called uh, ocean acidification. We should be thinking about it in the same format, you know, and. Uh, it's not just P. We're measuring reef tank acidification using pH, but pH is not the issue. So, uh, you know, assuming that your alkalinity is spot on, which most people's it is, or you're going to have totally different problems. Mm. Uh, assuming that 99.9% .9 of the time, if you have a problem with pH, pH is just a measurement of the problem, mm -hmm. right? Well, the problem is actually all the excess carbon dioxide in our homes. So basically, like, you know, the ocean's problem is we're driving too many cars. Yeah. In our house, the problem is, is we're breathing too much. Breathing a whole lot. We got pets, we got all kinds of stuff yeah. breathing in our house. And so we create an artificially high level of uh, carbon dioxide in the house. And how bad that problem is, is relates to how bad the problem will be in the tank, because the tank is essentially the sink for us now. Exactly. Yep. Sucking it all up. So I'll give you an example. We've got 100 <clears throat> people working here at BRS. And uh, at peak hours, man, some of the tanks here could hit 7.5. Yeah, I've seen all it. All that low. Because there's so many people breathing carbon dioxide in your and attributing to reef tank acidification inside of uh, like the BRS walls here. <laughs> pH, the measurement of that. Yeah. Uh, also, what matters most is that reef tank acidification, RTA, is real and it matters more than 90% of the topics that reefers debate. You can debate what's the best lighting, you can debate PAR, you can debate water chemistry, you can debate, you know. Uh, salt mixes and all of these hot button ticket items that uh, we argue about or we have argued about over on the forums, uh, is we're, we're missing the real issue here and the real topic that we should be talking about or arguing, uh, which is the reef tank acidification. Some people, the people in the know are nodding their heads right now. I saw reef tank, uh, yeah. uh, Ryan Thompson post on a, a post earlier. He was like, yep, he gets it. Yeah. Uh, but like, there's a lot of people out there that don't really get it. By the end of today's video, for sure, you will get it. And hopefully you hang in there and share it because you're going to be able to share this with other people. And we can change the trajectory of people's reefs together if we share the information. Because it exists. It, I would call it, I don't say these things like very often where like, this is true. This is the yeah, way. Definitive statements. Uh, yeah. Definitive statements for sure. This is one, man. For sure, we have been screwing up, and there's so much meat on the table <laughs> here to uh, find some progress. If only we want it. And it's not hard, and it's not expensive, and there's a bunch of uh, little easy things to do. You just have to decide you want to do it. I mean, if you want accelerated growth and stronger corals, this is your ticket. Okay. In that spirit, also, one other thing that matters. 
is like BRS TV has done, uh, uh, BRS TV investigates. We did some research here. We came up with the results. Uh, non peer, non, uh, you know, journal peer reviewed science and stuff. We're just, you know, hobbyists who uh, have an idea and an understanding of how to test the stuff. And, and they're willing to just put six months into it. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. set four takes up and take care of them and document it. Yes. And that one showed definitely the pH matters. You want a lot more growth. There it is. But here's the fact of it. What matters most is there's people smarter than Randy and Ryan that have done all of this work for us many, many times over for the last 40 years. <laughs> That's, uh, it's being done. Go Google ocean acidification. You'll find 80 uh, different, dozens. I mean, I don't know, man. It might be 800 articles Videos, on this. Videos, Peer reviewed science. Yeah, you can get all the data, you can get charts, you can get you know the chemistry, you can get everything behind yeah, it. You understand the whole thing. So this isn't uh, Randy and Ryan, this is actually the hobbyist, me, yeah. uh, it's just got it wrong. Uh, yeah. you know, so there you go. Been thinking about the wrong thing. All right. <laughs> what matters most here, I had to throw this one in there. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm campaigning for this. I can't help it. Yeah. Uh, which is those who fight this progress will look silly in the end. Uh, in the end, man, like a few years from now, the people that fight this one and say 7.8 is just fine. My tank was awesome at 7.8, and you guys are wrong for saying that. It's like the Earth is flat. Uh, it will oh, be that wrong. Flat, earth, <laughs> flat earthers. <laughs> yes. Okay. Non RTAers. So in that spirit, I went out today and I found. Uh, I've read a lot about this, but I just went out and found a few articles. I I quoted uh, direct from uh, mm -hmm. the the articles. Uh, just to give you some information on how to do this. We built some little models here, so uh, we'll be able to kind of show you how some yeah, of this stuff yeah, works. Yeah. Uh, but the first one is from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority on Ocean Acidification. This is run by the Australian government. Okay, so first bullet. First bullet is acidification occurs because the ocean acts as a carbon sink, absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Yep, so we just pump air, carbon dioxide in the air, and where all that carbon lands is in the ocean, ocean turns it into carbonic acid and becomes more acidic. CO2 plus H2O. Happens in our tanks too, same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the aquarium in our house is the carbon dioxide sink, or one of them, yeah. uh, in the house for all the excess breathing that's happening in there. All right, next one. When seawater absorbs carbon dioxide, this causes the seawater to become more acidic and for the carbonate ions to become less abundant. All right. So this is Ooh. one of the things, the first thing we're going to, like, let's start to grasp, like, what's actually happening here. Uh, yeah. All right. So uh, Dave and everybody was nice enough to go out and build these for us. <laughs> so this is a carbonate ion. Uh, and this, actually, let's start right here. You'll start with calcium carbonate? This is the holy grail here, right? This is a calcium carbonate ion. This is the base structure of what you're trying to grow in the aquarium. All right, so if I cover up uh, this part right here, uh, this is just a carbonate ion, right? Uh, and for those of you who know, you've tracked with it, you're trying to build calcium carbonate uh, mm -hmm. skeletal structure. So we add the calcium on there. And now there is a, a calcium, carbonate. calcium carbonate. So how many of these carbonate ions are in the water and how many calciums are in the water and in, inherently how much is in the coral's tissue obviously matters because we want to build this thing. Yeah. So we'll get to the rest in just a second. But That's calcium the ion, uh, carbonate ion, these are the things we want. I'm going to repeat this one sentence now that we understand that, which is... When seawater absorbs carbon dioxide, this causes the seawater to become more acidic, and for the carbonate ions, one of the parts that we want, to be less abundant. Mm. So when you lower the acidity of the water or, or make it more acidic, these things disappear. So if I have less abundant carbon ca or, uh, calcium carbonate uh, availability in the water, I have less coral growth or more brittle growth. Should be, you should connect the dots here. Mm -hmm. All right. So. And here's the next part. A decline of 0 0.1 from the pre-industrial times one -tenth. Uh, in the ocean. One-tenth of a point. So the difference between uh, 8.1 8 and 8.1 uh, uh, in the ocean surface corresponds to a... Okay, I'm going to read it again. Uh, the decline is 0 0.1 from pre-industrial times is already recorded in the pH of the ocean surface, taking it down to 8.1. So it was an 8.2. Uh, and this corresponds to a 26% increase in acidity. So 
every for every single pH point from like four to five, uh, every single point is uh, like ten times. Ten times. Yep. So four to five, ten times. Four to six, a hundred times. Yeah, if you live in uh, log California... Log logarithmic, I think yeah, they say. Yeah, if you live in California, you understand what we're talking about, because the same thing with logarithmics, like earthquakes, too. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Like where a six is not just barely more than a five. Yeah, it, exactly. It's a lot more. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, on the Richter scale. Okay, so, so... A tenth of a point is a 26% increase in acidity. It's a lot. It That's sounds right. like nothing. It's, you know, 8.1, 8.2. Mm. It sounds like nothing to you, but it is. Yeah. Next one. Next one is, I mean, this should really hit home for us because uh, reef development is thought to cease at 7.8. This is, they're saying by the end of this century, uh, if the scales continue the way they're going, we could see the 7.8, which they're saying the thought is that reef development will just cease. This is the Great Barrier Reef Marine and Park Authority Australian government telling mm. us that all the scientists there tell you reef development is thought to cease at 7.8. I'll tell you, you could go find that number all over the place. It's yep. not just that. Yep. Right? Yet somehow in our hobby, we we're like, oh, yeah, 7.8 is fine. 7.8 is fine. Hmm. Mm. Cease. Wow. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, we're saying this, and I'm like, I, I'm saying it kind of. Uh, fun like this because honestly I thought this for a long long time oh yeah I've been told 7.8 to 8.3 is just fine so it's really kind of important I've given to, that like, advice because yeah, that's all I've known yeah me yeah. too yeah, yeah yeah you know it's because what everybody's told everybody so you know if we want to progress it's really important that we kind of embrace all the reasons and how goofy some of this really is mm -hmm. that like why were we listening because like there's a lot of areas like I say this all the time about uh, um, Dana Riddle's articles like I go back and read them and I'm like this dude answered questions 20 years ago. <laughs> nobody listened. And nobody, nobody listened. Yeah, nobody picked it up. <laughs> yeah, if only somebody listened to this mm. stuff. You know, one time, you know what we should do is a, a missing episode of yeah. all the things that nobody listened to Dana Riddle about. <laughs> <laughs> I just picked one up in my recent <laughs> video from yesterday. It was the, the par, uh, par and yellowing and the change in uh, par from yellow water. Oh, sure. In his article, it's, uh, there was a section that I pulled out that said, the difference of par in yellow water versus clear water had little to no meaningful result. It did in an artificial test result, but uh, not in when he yeah. did it. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Mm. So we should do that episode. Interesting. Yep. All right. Another thing from that article: uh, ocean acidification is also expected to make it more difficult for many plankton uh, to mm. form the basis of the entire marine food chain to build calcium carbonate, limestone shells, plates, and skeletons. The bottom of the food chain in the ocean are mm -hmm. these plankton and these uh, crustacean cr creatures. We're talking, you know, copepods, amphipods. We're also talking about, uh, to some degree, things like uh, coralline algae, which is a really simple structure uh, or animal, like, or, mm. I don't know. What is coralline algae? I guess. Calcareous algae. Calcareous algae. Yeah. Well, there you go. So uh, that kind of thing. Also, ocean acidification is expect, uh, expected to make it more difficult for these. And you can actually find it like NOAA's website. You can see a projection. You know, yeah, as the actually they show you like at a different acidity how the like shells of these microorganisms actually dissolve. Mm. And you can see it in a reef tank where if you have a high pH, you watch coralline algae just explode. Oh, yeah. If you watch uh, closer to 7.8, you just can't grow it for some reason, mm -hmm. or it even disappears. It actually dissolves itself. Mm. Yeah, I mean, th that could be a measurement right there, just visually of how your pH is doing in your tank, but. You know what's interesting too, actually, this is like a really good point. So a lot of people have seen coralline algae like dissolve in their tank, it disappears. Mm. But you know what? Like in my tank where we let the tank dry out uh, for a, uh, like a day, or no, it was actually a little while before we let, we let it, we had to plumb it and everything. Oh yeah. So all the coralline algae in the back just turned white and yep. died, right? It's still white and it's still there. However, if your coralline algae just left the back and there's no trace of it, the skeletal structure behind that calcareous egg actually dissolved. Yeah. I'm it didn't just die. If it's gone, it just dissolved. Well, you, think a, you think of a calcium reactor and how close to 7.8 the melting of calcium reactor media, specifically the little coral bits that were straight from dead coral, how close that is to 7.8. You know, you can melt some of the calcium reactor media at 7, 7.1, 7.2. Mm -hmm. That's super close to 7.8. All right, in just a minute, we're, uh, mm. or a few minutes anyway, we're going to start telling you actually how to solve this problem. Mm. But who it's for. In the spirit of the missing episode and how important this is, 
we have another article. So this article uh, is from the uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And the first one, uh, first bullet I pulled out of there was, ocean acidification partially impedes the thickening Particularly process. Particularly impedes. Right, has anybody bumped their coral just even a tiny little bit and watch it just crumble and puff all off? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Especially uh, acro lovers, lovers stick lovers. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So ocean acidification partially impedes particularly. the thickening. Uh, particularly, rather. Yeah, you're Specifically right. Specifically uh, impedes. It impedes the thickening process, decreasing the skeleton's density and leaving them more vulnerable to breaking. You think of how many animals live in, uh, in and around, you know, I mean, look at the colonies behind us and picture that in the ocean and how many animals are in and out and around and dart and bump and, you know, once these coral skeleton structures are less dense and more brittle, uh, the chances that these fish natural behavior starts breaking colonies apart uh, is really concerning. Mm -hmm. And like... Like you said, if you reach into your tank and you're kind of digging around and a whole chunk or branches just kind of crumble off, part of that could be due to that uh, less dense skeletal structure. And so some of the corals are actually, all this stuff, a lot of this stuff depends on the species, but some of the corals will actually continue to grow upward at the same rate. Mm. So, you know, they're all kind of growing towards the sun, mm -hmm. essentially, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and a whole coral <clears throat> reef is based on, like, how effective it can do that. And one of the reasons they're talking about why pH actually destroys an entire reef is that well, even though it's growing up as fast, it's way less dense, and so it just crumbles. Like waves hit it, yeah. you know, other animals hit it. One thing, rock falls, crushes the whole thing, mm. and, like, and then all the other little bits crush everything else. It's just super delicate, and you've seen this in your own reef tank. Whereas, like you know, in some really robust tanks, you can bump the coral. It's just fun. It's a stony coral. Other times, you bump it, and it just snaps like crazy. I mean, you can barely even touch oh, it without it, it breaking. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, there's a difference here. Well, I mean, even when you're going to frag, you know, if I'm fragging and things are just breaking pretty easily, I might be like, oh, this is nice. But, you know, what you really want is, like, hard to break that, hard to frag that thing. You want it to grow that way. Fragging yeah. It. yeah <laughs> okay, so uh, let's read the next one. Uh, this is all from this woods thing, and a lot of this is about density, by the way. Yeah, W-H-O-I, uh, coral polyps, the tiny soft body coral animals, bring in seawater containing HCO3 negative, uh, so, and calcium ions, so. Uh, it's bringing in calcio 3 negative. It's bringing in bicarbonate yep. and carbonate. At the into same the time, water. into the calcifying space between its cells and the surface of the existing uh, skeleton. So bicarbonate, it really can't do anything with, right? Okay. And carbonate, it wants, calcium carbonate it wants. All right, so. Is anybody familiar with baking soda and soda ash? Sodium right. bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate and sodium carbonate. These both exist in the water, right? Yeah. And you remember that we're actually trying to create this little guy right here. Uh, oh, uh, got it. oh, yeah. This guy right here, which is uh, calcium carbonate, carbonate with calcium on it. Yep. Right? Okay. So, carbonate exists in the water in two forms. One is. A, this guy go. right here, uh, which is uh, carbonate. just carbonate. This is bicarbonate. So it looks almost identical, right? Except for it's got this little hydrogen attached to the side mm -hmm. of it. Okay, this little hydrogen is the thing that really matters because this thing actually, sh these shift between each other like yeah. constantly. Could be carbonate, could be bicarbonate, could be carbonate, could be bicarbonate. And, uh, you it's know, just trading that hydrogen ion. Based on the pH, it decides which one it's going to mm. be. At a higher pH, there's just way more of these things than these things. At a lower pH, they actually pick up all these little hydrogen balls on it. So here's the important part is do you see any of those little white balls on this guy. No. Right? All right. So what happens when you create, uh, push the, car, the calcium onto this thing is that the little white ball has to pop off, mm -hmm. right? So now we've got a free-floating hydrogen. So for those of you who don't know, pH is the measurement of how many of these little H's, pluses are floating around in the water. Mm -hmm. uh, the more of these little guys are floating around in the water, the more acidic the water is. And so for that reason, the more of these we can have in the water, the less creation of these when the coral's popping these things off. So that is like, there's a lot of complexity to you know, how this all works and it's not completely all known, but mm -hmm. it's basically the ratio 
between these two things here and this little white ball called hydrogen or H, H, I, 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 ionic hydrogen or H+. plus. So the, point, the bullet that I mentioned says the, coal, uh, the coral pro, uh, polyps bring in bicarbonate and release the hydrogen ion. Yeah, so, so basically the coral is pulling all that water from the seawater mm -hmm. into its own tissue and it will use the carbonate or the bicarbonate, but if it uses the bicarbonate, it has to get rid of that acidity. And when it gets rid of that acidity and it pops off, now the acidity, acidity inside of its own tissue goes way up, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so now it has to release itself and get rid of that acidity. But if there's a lot of acidity in the surrounding water, it's actually hard to get to pump out the mm -hmm. hydrogen again. So this is a little bit of the science that happens behind it. And uh, I'm going to read it again yep. here. Cor coral polyps, the tiny little soft bodied animals, bring in the water containing the bicarbonate and carbonate and the calcium ions, and the mm -hmm. calcium finds space within its tissue, between its cells, and at the surface, uh, uh, and at the surface of the existing skeleton to build it. Yep. So if you know all that, what's next? Uh, next is they pump hydrogen ions, like we said, out of that calcifying space to produce more carbonate ions, making it easier to make calcium carbonate for their skeletons. But when the oceans absorb excess CO2, which is happening now, there are more calcium carbonate ions, but fewer calcium, or there are more bicarbonate ions, but fewer calcium car or carbonate ions in the seawater, making it harder for corals to accelerate, so or, uh, to get rid of that uh, and build skeleton structures. So basically, uh, there's more of those free floating hydrogen ions in the water, driving down pH and increasing acidity, and the coral has a hard time getting rid of the bicarbonate uh, hydrogens from the bicarbonate brought in. All right, I'm just gonna dumb this all down. Okay. All right, at a pH of 8.3, there is just a lot more carbonate in there than there is at an 8. Point, uh, or at 7.8. Yes. If there's a lot more carbonate in the water, you're gonna grow corals faster. Also. And denser. A, yes, and denser, <laughs> yes. Uh, and healthier, you're gonna see in a second too. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, also, at 8.3, or at 7.8, there's a lot of these hydrogens just floating around the water or attached to the bicarbonate as well. There's a lot more of them out there that came from the carbon dioxide, or the carbon dioxide in the air. And if these are floating around in the water surrounding the coral, it's just a lot harder for the coral to pop this thing off and then release it mm -hmm. back into the water. This is the reason why. And honestly, you don't need to even understand any of what we just said to just know that everything in science says that 7.8 is going to grow corals a lot slower, and a lot uh, uh, more brittle than 8.3, and it's also going to affect a bunch of other metabolic functions you're going to see in a second. 100%. Okay, so uh, uh, the WHOI also has, the, to better understand these processes or processes, the researchers examined the coral growth process and showed that as pH and carbonate ions decline in ambient seawater, so do concentrations of carbonate ions in corals calcifying space. Consequently, the corals can't produce as much aragonite to thicken the skeleton. Uh, layman's term, there's less of this in the surrounding seawater. There's less of it inside of the coral as well. There you go. All right. So here's where the data really comes together, though. They used the 3D computerized uh, top op or tomography CT scanner to image the skeletal uh, cores, which reveal annual growth brand, uh, bands, much like rings in a tree. From the scans, they were able to discern and separately quantify and, uh, uh, the upward and thickening components of the coral growth. Their analysis revealed a consistent correlation the skeletons of corals in more acidic, lower pH water and fewer carbonate ions were significantly thinner. Mm. So water that has more of those eight plushes and fewer of these in it produced thinner uh, 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 skeletal structure as identified by a CT scanner. You think about it in the terms of like a tree rings. If you were to think about tree rings and you'd see, it's like if you were able to see uh, that one year the tree had really thick uh, growth lines and the next year it had really th or thinner ones and then the next year thinner, even thinner and even thinner and even thinner rings. 
basically that's what they're saying here is they kind of they looked at the corals and the way that they're laying down the aragonite structure and found that it's just getting thinner and thinner and especially the, or when they see the lower ph compared to higher ph all right one more of these and we're going to get to the meat of it how do we actually solve this problem mm -hmm. because uh, once we identify there is a problem how do we solve it so this is the last piece so we talked about uh, first that it, it's about calcium carbonate uh it's about uh, the acidity we also now talked about how a lot of this conversation is about density all right also there's another layer to this so the National Academy of Sciences uh, did ocean, uh, ocean acidification causes bleaching mm. and productivity loss in coral reef builders. Okay, so this is the piece that I hadn't actually read before, uh, but I've read some things close to this, but not as definitive as this. And this is National Academy of Sciences. Ocean acidification causes bleaching and productivity loss in coral reef builders, meaning slower uh, photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. uh, had you heard that before? I have not. Yeah. Not the bleaching event. Uh, I had heard that the bleaching events are, you know, uh, temperature based in some degrees. And uh, now it's uh, ocean acidification. You know what? It's, they tie together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, when you put the <laughs> two together, even worse. Okay, we do this in our tanks too, by the way. You're going to see in a second. Mm. Okay. All right. So, uh, first uh, bullet from that one uh, Ocean acidification represents a key threat to coral reefs by reducing the calcification rate of framework builders. All right. This is the stuff that we already said. Mm -hmm. Second, in addition, acidification is likely to affect the relationship between corals and their symbiotic dinoflagellates, known as the zooxanthellae, yep. uh, and the productivity of this association. So the lower the pH here is actually going to affect the relationship between the zooxanthellae or the symbiotic dinoflagellates uh, and the productivity of uh, that relationship. Hmm. This is uh, new news. Right? <laughs> uh, like, I don't know how many, raise your hand out there if you had already known that. Tied zooxanthellae to pH. Okay. High CO2 in, this, uh, in their studies, so high uh, uh, CO2, uh, which means low pH, led to 40 to 50% bleaching uh, for Acropora after eight weeks of experimentation. 40 to 50%. Intermediate CO2 led to marginally more bleaching. All right? CO2 led to dramatic reductions in daily productivity as hourly rates of photosynthesis. Calcification was highly sensitive to the highest CO2 dosing in effect was exacerbated by warming from 78 uh, degrees to 82. Mm. Like okay. that, that little, what, five degree shift. So I, I can't find this article. I was trying to find it this morning. But I read one about the Caribbean, which is the pH lowers. And it's not like that it's just going to wipe out the whole reef. It drops 10.1. But what it does is it makes it weaker and more susceptible to other issues. And so when there is a particularly hot season in the Caribbean, it goes up a couple of degrees, it's way more likely to have a, a bleaching event. Mm. And this is what this thing said too. Calcification was highly sensitive, or, or was highly sensitive to the highest CO2 dosing, and the effect was exacerbated, exacerbated by warming from 78 to 82. Wow! I and mean, that's the ranges that we live in in our tanks. Yeah. How often? Do, how many times in owning a tank for a, you know five years will the tank hit 82? I've hit it multiple times. Yeah. Did you forget the air conditioner doesn't work? I mean, eight million reasons. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. And that is what the what we've really been saying is uh, like, all right. Well, not only is it slowing corals, but it's stressing them out. It could cause bleaching. It could attribute. And usually, like any organism. Almost any organism isn't like one thing you did so bad that it no. killed it. It's the accumulation. And then there's a tipping point. Right? Mm -hmm. Something happens, stress, uh, stress event, or you know, change in pH, change in temperature, and that's when things wipe out. Okay. So this is the point where you can say, all right. Are you going to stay with us or are you going to check? I, I believe or I disbelieve. If you disbelieve, you check out right now because you know it's not <laughs> worth any of your time. But if you do believe now that, you know what, there's a difference. And this is the difference that I'm going to say is 7.8 to 8.3 is a survival zone. It's a zone where stuff in here won't die. 
right away, especially if you do everything else perfect. Mm -hmm. and, right? and growth still can occur at 7.8. I've seen reef tanks in that range uh, that are still growing. But uh, the difference between survivability and you know flourishing is like, that's something that I want to I'd chew, I'd aim for. You know, survivability, brittle corals. Decide for yourself. Uh, check out now if you haven't been convinced uh, the rest of this is not for you. If, uh, if you're like, you know what? I want to do better. I want to grow better. I don't want to have bleaching events and, uh, and uh, I want to have healthier animals and I want to evolve the conversation and want to share with other people. Here it is. So some hard lessons here. So what were the hard lessons we learned about pH? Since 2015. The lost, <laughs> since, since the lost episode. I mean, this is like the hardest change I've had uh, on any kind of oh, topic, 100%. I think. Yeah, 100%. Uh, okay, decide, and this is probably why we're here, decide who to listen to. I was listening to my fellow reefers, my Me friends, too. everybody on the forums. Uh, I mean, I think even like Randy Holmes Farley, I was reading his articles, man. I looked at him as a mentor. Even there it says, you know, 7.8, 8.3, mm. it may be fine. And it's, and it's actually, if you say... If you, if you read it, it even says in their typical ocean values, like 8.2, but there's enough reefers that have been successful lower that I guess it's probably a safe range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the part, man. I think you're just we're just feeding it in there. So uh, here's the part. is decide who to listen to. I was listening to my fellow reefers uh, and the general belief within the community and ignoring the scientific community. So I mean, I was ignoring... Like, I don't know why the whole community was ignoring decades of people doing experiments on this, yeah. uh, real ones. And well, I mean, we have our you know our reef tank uh, scientists or our saltwater aquarium scientists that are hobbyists that you know like the Randy Holmes Farley, the Dana Riddles, and things like that. That uh, uh, you. It's the same thing that you said early on, and like nobody's listening to Dana Riddle, Riddle articles because you go back and you find out that he already did all this stuff years and years and years ago. Uh, so the, you know, if you're deciding who to listen to, uh, all of us, even my, I'm, I'm guilty of listening to the community, and I'm guilty of feeding that information back because uh, I just I didn't, I didn't know, uh, but the information was out there, but nobody was applying it like to our tanks. Well, it's hard because it's true. I've kept many tanks between 7 point, and they rose up to 8.3 during the day, yes. and they went to 7 8 point at night, yep. and kept them in that range somewhere. And I would they still call been, this a success. They haven't been epic failures. Yeah, exactly. Right? But I can tell you, dude, there's a lot of people that have filled out their tanks two to three times faster in some cases than some of the tanks I had, and I would certainly want that. I'm trying to, uh, the, all those yeah. questions are like, what do you do, what do you use, what's your lighting, what's this on the epic looking tanks? Uh, pH should be part of that question. Okay, and there's also like a huge swath, man, of people, like probably 80% of reefers out there that just randomly lose corals. Mm -hmm. And then there's this chunk of 10 to 20% that never lose corals. Yeah. What's the difference between those two people, <laughs> man? And there is one. I man. wouldn't be surprised if it was pH. Yeah, a, a big chunk of big it. Big chunk man. of it. Okay. All right. And and by pH, may they maybe they addressed it, or maybe they just live alone and they don't have any pets, and so like they're not really in a big house that yeah. doesn't really have carbon dioxide it's issues. Not concerned with. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it doesn't have to be that you did something right or wrong. You could have just stumbled into it. But if you got four pets and four kids, dude, you're in a different world. Uh, <laughs> and you live somewhere and the winter times are brutal and you just don't have the ability to keep fresh air circulating through. Well, also, if you, got, uh, if you live in an uh, old house that breathes a lot, if you live in a new house that's like sealed up, if you have four kids inside of a 2,000 foot, uh, 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 you know, a, like a, a 1,500 foot mm -hmm. apartment, Versus a you know four thousand foot house you know with an air exchanger yeah. you could have just stumbled into those things that made the difference between the twenty percent and, and the eighty percent didn't even know some of them were probably just doing it right yeah <laughs> <laughs> some of them were probably listening to the scientists uh, yeah. uh, instead okay so none of these solutions uh, that we're about to share with you are uh, perfect or ideal for all people mm -hmm. but you have to understand how they work. And then you can apply that knowledge to your situation because it will all work. But there isn't one magic one that's the best for all people. No. There are some that are just best for different people. There's some good options out there. I've tried multiples of some of these uh, of these options uh, to try to fix pH. But uh, for, like we're going to talk on uh, we're going to talk about running a fresh air line out of your skimmer outside. 
uh, how many people have the ability to or want to like drill a hole through the house or find a but way if you to do, put a tube out? If you got a drill bit and a two dollars worth of tubing, this conversation's done for you. <laughs> yeah, really, all the stuff we're talking about, the resistance to the conversation, solved with like four feet of tube and a drill, a uh, drill bit. Uh, so, like, uh, it, uh, there's no reason for resistance to that conversation. Okay. Uh, all right. Assuming your alkalinity, all, everything we're about to share with you assumes your alkalinity is on point. We suggest a 9 DKH. This is almost certainly about excess CO2 in your home and solving that. So, if, if your alkalinity is on, it, your low pH is almost certainly related to excess carbon dioxide in the house. Mouth breathers. There are the 1% solutions out there with somebody that really jacked their chemistry somehow mm -hmm. uh, or like unknowingly is dosing acid to their tank or uh, who knows. Yeah. Uh, but those are the oddballs. Uh, almost everybody out there should just hear, I should solve CO2 in my get Make sure alkalinity is on, but you should do that anyway. And now <laughs> solve the CO2. All right. We're going to go through four things with each one of them. Uh, why, why this option's good, why this option's bad, uh, future ideas and how it could be improved, yep. and when this might be a good option for you, starting with fix the ambient air in your house to begin with, and then you don't have to worry about the tank. Now, this is that CO2-laden, heavy-breathing air. This is something that uh, we could fix here at BRS. You know, We have so many people breathing in this office and breathing within these walls uh, to fix the ambient air in here. I mean, Maybe you have to run the fans or the coolers or what have you to clear out some of the CO2. But uh, for a lot of people, it's uh, once you clear this excess CO2 out of your house, your problem solved. All right. So the good news on this thing is it's a permanent solution. If you solve the CO2 problem in your home, mm -hmm. you'll never worry about this again. Yeah. Like, so permanent solution. Uh, you can open up some windows. Easy. That's a permanent solution. You should leave some windows open. Now, hopefully nobody crawls in them. I <laughs> uh, hope they live in a place that uh, uh, weather as well. Yeah. But an air exchanger. So an air exchanger, and not in every house, but on many houses, it's just going to like take some of the air of the house, blow it out, and suck some new air in, and exchange the heat uh, uh, like a recovery, just to like you know save on energy. Yep. As you do that, if you're pumping some of the air out and adding new air in. In many cases, this will just solve it for you. Yeah. Uh, if you have an air exchanger in your house, this might not be your problem. This next one's interesting, uh, and that's using plants. Mm -hmm. And uh, it'd be interesting if we brought a whole bunch of plants in here in, B in the BRS offices and see if that helps solved. But uh, you know, there was uh, comments. You know, I've seen comments all over the forums. Like, can I put a plant next to my tank and increase my pH? Uh, and you know, if you get some high photosynthetic, um, you know, fast-growing plants, it probably does have uh, some effect. You know, I, I was reading about this because people use plants to actually suck pollution out of the air mm. too. Like in a new house, like they get like formaldehyde and yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that, and you can actually use plants to suck it up all the pollution, <laughs> That's you know, not just the excess carbon dioxide that it also sucks up. Oh, interesting. Uh, I know, very interesting. Uh, there is some pretty big debate on how effective it is, yeah. uh, and there's like science and how it works, and uh, by NASA uh, in space and how like you can use uh, plants yeah. to suck up carbon dioxide and release oxygen yeah. and pollutants that are up there as well. Hmm. Uh, but uh, in the end, if you have a really big house, you're going to need a lot of plants. A lot of plants. So if you live in a studio apartment, uh, maybe. A couple, couple fast-growing ferns, big tall ones, yeah, see what happens. If you're going to do this, it's worth a Google because there's, like, there's a bunch of people that have tested like eight, nine plants yeah. uh, and things like you would think. I would immediately go to fast-growing plants. Yeah, that's what I would, too. Yeah, like a spider plant, though, which uh, to me has been oh, a pretty fast-growing plant. Crawls around the wall. Yeah, yeah and it like, shoots out little spiders yep, and yep, stuff yep, on yep, it. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, that thing uh, doesn't actually suck up that much CO2. Oh, wow. So there's actually some that do it better than others. All right, so the bad on fixing the ambient air in your house is most of us can't keep our windows open year-round yeah. or even really more than... than I mean, I mean, right now I wouldn't even open my window. Populated areas, I wouldn't keep my windows open. Uh, up here in the cold, cold north, wouldn't keep my. You can't keep your windows open. I yeah. mean, if Florida, you're, you're going to no spend way. more in gas, you know, and heating to keeping the house warm uh, than benefit of your CO2. I actually did open up my windows in the winter. Uh, this is a mistake of my youth, uh, and what happened was the all cold air rushed over the windowsill mm -hmm. and then uh, does what cold air does, which is sink, 
and it went and hit the hot water pipe, and while the hot water pipe wasn't running as the radiator, uh, yeah. it froze it and then burst and exploded water in my house. Oof. Yeah. Yeah, so don't open your windows in the winter. I, th I think a majority of the, uh, a lot of people in the States would have this problem. Yeah, so uh, that's one of the bad solute, bad things for fixing it in your house. Uh, an air exchanger. If you don't already have one, uh, getting that into your HVAC is you know, Spending. prohibitively expensive yeah. for most people. Yeah, you're doing a lot of work. You have to prop, you have to hire professionals to come in. You're talking labor, thousands of dollars. The house might not even really. You might and be like, ripping up well, floors. My or house wouldn't accept it because I don't have. Uh, I have a secondary CO2 and I have a boiler, or a secondary AC and I have a boiler, and there's really no. no place to put this thing yeah I, I mean maybe i'm not an hvac thing but it, like or a professional but it it's probably prohibitively expensive if you don't already have it by the way if you do have one they all have settings too so if yours is like hey man i already have an air exchanger and it's really i still have ph problems crank it up mm -hmm. uh and you can probably even crank it up farther than it says crank it up <laughs> uh so uh, talk to your hvac guy about how you want to do that uh another bad uh the plant piece which plant lighting is dependent on your home and your HVAC? Okay, which plant and how well this whole thing works is all dependent on a few things. It is really, really dependent on lighting. So just like when we found with the refugiums, all the articles I read about this morning were that if you light the uh, plant at twice the light, it consumes twice the amount of carbon dioxide. Mm. I like so, immediately went to refugiums. I'm like, well, of course, you yeah. already found this out. So you get yourself a, a H1200 or an H360 and put it on your house plants, and it'll suck up uh, CO2 faster. <laughs> yeah, well, so like if uh, also if sunlight, if I have like a a, win a bunch of windows that get a lot of sunlight and I put a bunch of plants in there, yeah. it will almost certainly increase increase the amount of CO2 sucked out of the room versus a couple of plants in a dark area of the room. Yeah. Uh, which probably wouldn't grow that well anyway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, and then things like if you're already sucking a bunch of the seed CO2 out with your HVAC and replacing it, the plant really kind isn't of a moot gonna help. Yeah. Uh, it's also kind of dependent on whether or not your area has you know high levels of CO2. So like if you live in downtown Manhattan, uh, you might find that that's different than middle of mm -hmm. nowhere Wisconsin. You yeah, know, uh, the CO2 am, uh, amount of the outside air might be prohibitive. Yeah, if we live at where you live, there's probably less CO2 <laughs> than uh, like outside the door. Here. Yeah. <laughs> a bunch of cornfields. Yeah. All right. So uh, future things, man. I, one of the things that like all of these things I had a future idea on, and w one of them I thought of is consider urban gardening. All those garden walls of clay pots that you mm -hmm. uh, can grow you know herbs and spices and things like that they make them now so they could be beautiful as well yeah like they're like you're really cool you can do urban gardening you can grow hydroponics you can even do soil based ones uh and grow a bunch of plants there's a reason now to have artificial lighting in there like mm -hmm. the power of the sun and you're sucking up lots of co2 and you're making strawberries yeah i wrote down here bathroom fans bathroom vent fans turning those on I mean, if you have a leaky house, I wonder if you could keep your bathroom <laughs> fan running. Okay, you know and what? And just suck the bad no, air out. No. Yeah. It's a terrible idea. Uh. You know I know? Because uh. I did it. <laughs> okay. So uh, down in my basement, I had a humidity problem. Yeah. Right? And so and like, well, I got it's like 80% humidity, which is like uh, the rainforest. Right, right, right. Uh, I mean, it's because I had so many tanks down there. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what I did is I cut a hole in the wall and I got a big exhaust fan. And then the next summer came and I couldn't keep the house like cold, mm. they're like cool. It was so hot in there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then like the air conditioner never kept up, and I just couldn't figure out why it was. Mm. And it's it's obvious after the fact. And five people are like, "You dummy!" Right now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So not only when you blow air out of the house, does air have to come back in from somewhere? Right. So it was coming back in from outside, which was hot air. Right. Worse yet, the reason I figured it out is because one day I walked over to the coat closet and opened it up. Just hot. Okay, there was a like a seam that was open in the ceiling mm -hmm. that went to the superheated attic. Yeah. And all that superheated air in the <laughs> attic was where all the hot air was venting back into my yeah. house. I realized this. I tried this in my my old house. I had my ninety three cube set up when I first moved here, and uh, I was dealing with the same issue so I kicked on my bathroom fan in the winter time and then realized that my living room windows uh, that's where the air leak was there 
icicles, g big, giant, thick ice all over the inside of my windows because mm -hmm. the air was com meeting with the hot air inside, condensation, and just forming ice. Okay, I try these stories are great. <laughs> I don't. Know, I, I went back and tried to find it. So I could never find it again. But early on in reefing, I found a guy that decided to vent the humidity uh, into uh, the attic space. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody immediately know what would happen if you vent humidity into the attic space? He's like, oh, I got vents up there. Blah blah. blah I'll be yeah. fine. Depends on the temperature. Cold, ice. Yep. Heat, mold, and mildew, and it you know, was rotting wood. One. Yeah. Okay. Stalactites, uh, icicles, <laughs> I guess, but stalactites meeting uh, stalagmites, which it was like an ice palace in the top of this wow. guy's attic, right? And all I could see is in there, I was like, this dude has got maybe uh. 20, 30,000 pounds of water. And up then there. wait till the summertime when that thing uh, melts. melts and you have water damage inside. The I wish house. I knew what happened when he went to fix it because how would you get 30,000 pounds of water out of an attic anyway? Oh, Were you gonna chip it out? <laughs> Are you gonna melt it out? Like, what a giant wow. neighbor. Yeah. So make sure when you're thinking about HVAC, fans, man, not, uh, yeah, yeah. scratch. Scratch that. <laughs> Consider uh, your urban garden instead. Okay, so when might this be a good option though for you is fixing the ambient air in the whole house? <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, it's because you live in a, a temperate climate where you can leave the windows open all the time. If you live in Hawaii and it's 82 in the summer uh, and 78 in the winter and there's a nice cool breeze 100% of the time open and nobody windows. I know out there lives uh, closes their windows, boom. You got, you got your problem solved. You, man. Yeah. Problem solved. Uh, if you don't mind the air exchanger expense or you love plants and you're thinking about urban gardening anyways, yeah. man, this is for you. I think about, I would consider the air exchanger myself, even the cost, just because it's not, not just for a reef tank, but, you know, just getting rid of, having some uh, excess CO2 out of my house for, just makes me feel good about breathing in my house. You know what this reminds me of is like, we have, as reefers, we have all these excuses to buy stuff. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like, well... You know, it's not just I'd good like for a my generator. Tank. <laughs> right? I mean, it'd be nice to have a generator for a bunch of reasons. But I really need it for my reef tank. Yeah, yeah. You Boom. Closet. Right. Permission the, granted. Hide the fact that it's for your reef tank. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. Now we're gonna get to more real ones. Uh, that is just a lot of that is just kind of get a basic understanding of how hard it is to actually maintain. Yeah. Uh, you know, low CO two in a house. The next one is your skimmer in the outside air. Right. I've done this one. This is running the skimmer line, from extending the skimmer line, and running it outside. So good. the good is you're pulling air from outside, and it might be the only solution that you need. So you still have CO2-laden air inside, but your skimmer, which has the most surface area and brings in the most uh, uh, CO2 into your reef tank water, now you're feeding it with uh, far less CO2-laden air, and problem solved. One of the things that I've come to uh, uh, believe is on the surface, you know, you think of gas exchange and most people used to think of the surface of the tank. Yeah, right? we're causing ripples, yeah, all right. this. That's, that's where the gas exchange from the water and the air and the surrounding air. Mm. Uh, I now don't believe that is true. It's it, it, As long as you have a decent skimmer, which is, even the cheap ones today, I would put in the decent uh, mm -hmm. categories. They're just whisking air and water and there's like, eight million kajillion little bubbles in there that are creating a surface between the water and the air around it. And uh, uh, it's just super duper easy uh, to recreate way, 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 way more surface area than there is on the surface of the tank. Yeah, so I mean, I wonder if that means like getting rid of your skimmer could actually help solve the problem if uh, you're not willing to do some of these other things. It might if you didn't have a skimmer, it actually might slow the introduction of CO2 into the tank. Yeah. This is one of those experiments I actually want to do. Yeah. Is like, does having a skimmer actually lower the pH <laughs> of the tank? You would think ex uh, the opposite. Like, get good gas exchange will increase the yeah. pH. But if you have a lot of CO2 in your air and you have less uh, in the equilibrium in your tank, it's actually going to inject it uh -huh. faster. But like, it might be still enough just through the top of the tank. But the reason that I know that the skimmer actually has more gas exchange in this case is because 
when you do vent your skimmer outside and pull air from outside rather than from in your house, it works. The pH skyrockets. 100%. Yeah. I've seen it. Uh, I've seen it also with uh, CO2 it. media, a bunch of different ways. That's how we know, like, not just anecdotally looking at uh, how much surface area is in those bubbles, but it's in the results. Yeah. I don't know anybody that's, like, put draw air from outside and it hasn't improved the pH of the tank. Yeah. But there are some bad points to running your skimmer air outside. First one is it depends on the CO2 content of the air outside in your area. So where I live, out in the country, a bunch of farm fields, uh, probably not a problem. Lots mm -hmm. of, uh, lots of, uh, way less CO2 than uh, downtown Minneapolis and the sky rises. Mm -hmm. I don't really know how much it fluctuates, but like definitely you are reliant on low CO2 in the atmosphere of the city that you live in. Uh, I don't know how much that actually changes, but like it's only going to be as effective as the air that draws in from the outside. Something to consider. Uh, all right, uh, another one is uh, you really, this is like super duper important. Like think of everything that can happen, not just the likelihood of tomorrow. It's, could anything ever be sprayed or used near the intake? Mm. Right. Yeah, you go through in the springtime and you spray, uh, you know, bug spray, and you fertilize your lawn, your lawn, and uh, and you continue to do that type of stuff. You know, all of this could wind up just getting. I mean, your direct injection line into your reef tank. So what you're doing is you're gonna like assuming your tank is like on the wall, you're gonna drill a little three eighths inch hole, you know, or maybe half inch hole to the outside, and you're gonna take your skimmer tube, extend it a little bit, and just put it outside. Now, that's great, unless it's where a bunch of bushes are, where like rose bushes, and you're spraying pesticide and herbicide there, uh, uh, or you know somebody else in your household is, or you know you or get HOA a does. mouse yeah. problem, and you're or like a you know uh, not a mouse problem, but like a spider bike, box elder bug box elder problem, or spider problem. They're spraying the insecticide. Or even like all a little too close to the grass and you're doing fertilizer and all mm. that stuff. So when you put that airport out there, like really think like of everything that anybody's ever done to the lawn outside, anybody in your household, uh, and know this. You may remember what to do, but nobody else in your household probably will. <laughs> no. uh, yeah, Nobody's so what, thinking about your tank. Yeah, so just you know, really think about what pollutants could be there. Is it a place where you like park your you know lawnmower or your leaf blower or whatever, and it's just pumping carbon monoxide into <laughs> the area right there? Like, like, you know, best practice would definitely be somewhere where it's not going to get yeah. sucking pollutants from outside. Yeah. Okay. Uh, these next two are uh, somewhat uh, the same, but decrease. So uh, running an uh, uh, airline outside decreases low end, low end skimmer performance on short hose runs and decreases high end skimmer performance on long runs. You got to think about how much, uh, how much it takes to draw air through the length of your hose. Yeah, so there's always going to be head pressure. You mm -hmm. know, essentially we're taking a tube that was sucking air from the top of your skimmer, which is only, you know, two feet tall, yeah. and we're going to make that six feet by making it go through the wall and outside. It's just, that's like trying to breathe through a straw versus breathing through your mouth. Yeah, like a six-foot straw is way harder to breathe through than two. <laughs> so uh, it is. You're going to see it. The moment you do it, you'll see less air injected into the skimmer. And so something like that was already kind of a cheap skimmer really isn't going to handle that very well. Yeah. It might even just almost stall out. Uh, and then uh, with a, you know, a robust skimmer that is able to handle a lot of head pressure, I'm talking in this case now like a lot of cases the DC skimmers, which actually allow you to crank it up past where you need. Yeah. So it's really not a big problem if you, you know, send it outside and then you just crank it up a little bit. Yeah. Right? Yep. Uh, but if you're going to run it, 15 feet, it's probably not going to work. You're probably not going to see much you're, air. You're going to decrease, not only will you decrease the performance of your skimmer, it's not really going to suck that much air in it. So this is something you can visually test, man. Like get a flashlight, mm -hmm. look at this to skimmer, and then have somebody run Attach it outside, a hose, turn yeah. it on. Take a little video of it with your phone so you can kind of see it side by side. And you can probably visually see how much is less Is this going to work for you? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So... Uh, not that great. It does uh, part of the bad of using a skimmer pulling outside is it will decrease uh, the amount of air and the performance. 
This is also the next one here. I don't really know the effect of this, but it's always been in my mind mm. of outdoor temperature. If it's negative 10, like it gets here in Minneapolis, and I'm sucking in 600 liters an hour of air and having it injected into my tank, am I cooling the tank down? Hmm. I think uh, another concern on this one would be the, hum or the condensation that builds up inside the tube as you get closer to the skimmer. And if you're sucking in, you know, negative 10 degree weather, you know, how quickly mm. will that freeze and then block and then you know what happens when you how many of you have blocked or cut off or dropped the hose of your air intake into the water and seen the water level go whoop like this you know mm -hmm. yeah so what if i live somewhere where it's 100 degrees out consistently you know is that bringing in uh, heat? like i've been down in florida man it's not just 100 degrees like we get we get 90 some degrees here in minnesota during the day but at night dude it'll drop to 70. yeah uh I, I mean, you and me went mini golfing in Florida, dude, and like, it, was, it was like 100 <laughs> degrees at hot you know, and 1 a.m. Uh, <laughs> mini golf is barely tolerable. So, uh, if I'm injection 600 liters an hour, essentially like blowing a hair dryer at my tank, yeah. uh, what is the net, net effect temperature? I don't know, but it is something that you should be aware of when you do it. Uh, maybe somebody who has done this can chime in and mm -hmm. say, oh, yeah, this is what happened number. for yeah, me. Yeah. I, I haven't done it. I didn't have the temperature issue when I ran mine. It wasn't something I noticed uh, a lot of, but... Uh, I did have a different issue that uh, is not on here, mm. and that is uh, sucking in the fresh, for some reason, sucking in the fresh air, my, uh, my Venturi, my, you know, the air input, uh, would gunk up rapidly. I'm talking like within a week or two weeks, would gunk up with hard buildup, cal like uh, calcium buildup, and so I'd have to Pull the, I'd see my skimmers not performing. I'd have to pull the venturi off, and I'd have to take some, uh, like a dentist tool, break all that buildup off inside, and then put it back on. Anecdotally, you want to hear my, my reason? Because uh. you were sucking in acidic air before, and acidic air wasn't allowing for that buildup. Uh, yeah. The high pH in your tank, uh, uh, like when you raised up the pH in your tank, uh, to areas where ideal for calcification. Uh, well, you're going to see a little bit more precipitate as mm -hmm. well. Very well could be. And that's exactly what it was. It was, it was white, calcareous, like precipitate buildup. <laughs> oh, so that's yeah. a very interesting uh, outcome. Okay, the next one here is the skimmer. Instead of sucking low CO2 air from outside, let's scrub it off inside. Yeah. So and this is like space shuttle stuff, diving stuff. So like uh, CO2 scrubbing media is uh, used in uh, 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 diving where you breathe air out. It scrubs well, all the CO2 out. Type, you yeah. can read it, rebreathe the same air. It just keeps taking out the CO2. Mm. They do this in the space shuttle. Uh, they do it uh, in like anesthesia uh, to maintain the right level of drugs in a, a closed loop mm. uh, medium of that stuff. So there's a bunch of different reasons for it, but... You can put a CO2 scrubber on your skimmer and just suck air through the scrubber media and it Scru sucks all the CO2 scrub out. Scrub the CO2. Now, there's some good and the bad to, to that. Uh, first, the good one is that it could be the only solution you need. Again, like uh, like opening the windows, that could be the only solution you need. Here, uh, this may solve your pH problems because uh, if you're scrubbing the CO2 out before it gets in the tank uh, and it never uh, has the chance to build carbonic acid in your water, good to go. At some degrees, it's probably lower in the CO2 actually in the whole room. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, mine for some, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, it is true. Uh, the CO2 scrubber on your skimmer for most people will be the only solution you need. You just throw that little, you know, scrubber thing on there, CO2 thing, solved, done. Mm. Don't have to think about it again. Uh, you can actually peg the pH 24-7. Yep. So with a little solenoid that opens up to the room when you hit 8.3, uh, it just sucks air from the room uh, when it drops to uh, seven or uh, eight point two eight. It will close it, suck through the media again, and you'll hit eight point three twenty four seven. Never have to look back. Yeah, this uh, and which is they will we got to find somebody to make these solenoids rather than going to McMaster Car for the three eighths inch solenoids, but. Uh, Oh. And I, you know, I keep begging Neptune to. They have a, they have a quarter inch one, but that is going to strangle your skimmer. Yeah, we need a three eighths one. 
Yeah, and then I'd be also be concerned about the wear and the the wear and the tear if with a point zero two degree variance. You know, we'd have to figure out you know what what's the right ratio. So those for things length open and close, and like you'd be surprised. It's like it has a operating value of like uh, fifty thousand cycles open and closing. Like well, if it's if it does it, if it does it hundreds of times a day, we're talking thousands to millions of times a year. Yeah, so like it may be better off that you. Peg it like you said. Go between eight point two and eight point three, and then it won't open and close that much. Mm -hmm. right? So, good point. Uh, this skim rubber on your skimmer likely has the highest return on investment ROI of media on the tank, higher than uh, you know your light investment, higher than your two-part investment, or your calcium reactor investment, or your fuge, or all of the things you spend money on in your tank, scrubbing uh, CO2 with your skimmer might have the highest, in ROI meaning like stronger, faster growing corals. I want to reiterate this, like because nobody wants to use more media, nobody wants to buy media, nobody wants to change it out, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. All right, but here's the deal. Uh, all of the people out there are debating hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars in different lighting, hundreds of dollars Salts. in this skimmer, that skimmer, using a different salt. So, you know, one's a hundred bucks, one's fifty bucks. Uh, which additive system is best? You know, like, I mean, dude, it's it's just calcium carbonate in a, in some water. Man. <laughs> uh, you know, so did this this sticker the best sticker on my additive system yeah. over that one? And I'm paying an extra, you know, thirty bucks a month for one of them over the other one. There's so many areas where we debate, like which one's best for my tank. The 10 bucks in the media here, I b I'm pretty confident in saying has the highest ROI of any consumable product that you put on the tank. <laughs> Other uh, than food, maybe. Will, food is required. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you need aminos, foods, and proteins. Uh, uh, way more growth than we would see in the high versus low alkalinity and calcium testing. Uh, way more growth than we would see with the, you know, the proteins and amino acid testing that we've done. pH will grow your corals faster. There's also a cost of inaction. So you may think of like, oh, I'm buying this stuff to grow corals faster, but you're also just buying the stuff to keep them alive, stop them from bleaching and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Right? And so like, imagine you had you know, a little frag here, you know, and it grew into a colony. I don't know. I mean, if you were able to sell it, that colony is probably, if the first frag was 50 bucks, man, the colony could be rebroken up into a thousand bucks. Right. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you could probably sell the colony for a few hundred bucks. You know? If you grew it five times or five times faster? Well, 50% that, growth or avoided its death or it, even better. Yeah. Like the initial investment was 50 bucks, but like you said, it could be worth a thousand as a mother colony. And now you just wipe it out with low yeah. pH. Yeah, hmm. There you go. All right. So bad though, uh, bad on the scrubber. And for the, for those of you, if you want to check out, uh, my own, uh, Facebook, uh, page, just, uh, Ryan Beers TV, uh, you can check it out a bit. I'm broadcasting on right now. Oh yeah. I'm running, uh, I actually, the, uh, the media on the 360 in my office and I'm doing a recirculating design and I'm mm -hmm. updating people. I'm gonna actually update, I shot one already. I'm gonna update, like as soon as this video is over, I'm gonna show uh, like a change that I made to yeah. it. So you can, you can go see it. Uh, but there's, bad here. There's a bad part. Uh, to the, to the scrubber. Uh, scrubber is the media does need to be changed. And yeah. I, this is how often you need to change the media. It's some kind of complex uh, algorithm of how much air does your skimmer suck. Uh, with how much CO2 is in the air. So it's for some for everybody. people, it could be every two weeks. For some people, it could be every three, four days. Yeah. Uh, and in, like, so if you have this, the baddest skimmer known to man and it's sucking, uh, you know, 5,000 yeah. uh, liters an hour of air, well, it's going to do it five times faster than the 1,000. You know, provided it's probably reducing it in the surrounding air to some degree, but uh, there's that. Uh, and there's also just how much people are breathing in there. So yeah. I would say on average, most people should probably plan on changing out the media every week, week or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, you know, we haven't said it yet, and we haven't got through the rest of these, but you know, some of these can be combined. Oh yeah, definitely. You can get yeah. most of these things together. Yeah. So the, you can change out the media about every week ish. I, I think the media in generally is like 10, 12 bucks. So 10, 12 bucks is not something that everybody wants to spend once a week, uh, but for all the benefits we're talking about, you can weigh that for yourself. If you got two you know, little frags of Xenia in your tank, yeah. probably not worth it. If you've got a tank full of Acros or you're planning one, 
that one. I, 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 nobody wants to spend the ten dollars a month. But it's the best thing you could do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this another bad thing about scrubbers is it's less effective on huge tanks with lots of surface area. So, uh, are you seeing the pH increase? Are you able to peg it on your 360 gallon tank? No. So, like on the 160 here, uh, just putting the CO2 on there worked like a charm. Our problems actually worked too well. Uh, we had to open it up because it would hit 8.6. Yeah. If, if we just let it run, it would just keep going. It was so effective. Uh, but I th essentially, man, it's just a six foot tank, six by two feet ish. Yeah. Uh, my tank is more than double that size and it has a super huge sump as well. And so you're balancing the gas exchange that happens from on the surface of the tank with what the skimmer does. Mm -hmm. And the reality is the surface of my tank still adds some. So what uh, I went in that tank, and the reason I put it on there is because it was dropping here in a super high CO2 uh, or uh, acidic area is I was getting all the way down to like 7.5. And in the middle of the day, it was 7.8. Right, and so as soon as I put the media on, it went to the opposite. The bottom of the day was 7.8 and went up to uh, 8.0. Yeah. So here's the thing: is once I start putting corals in there, like you just mentioned, you're going to start combining. Yeah, combining solutions. some of these solutions. When I start using kelp washer or two part or whatever, it'll get me the rest of the way. Yeah. Uh, but right now I don't have any consumption, so I don't need those things, and it's not going to get me the rest <laughs> of the way. But yeah. So the size of your skimmer, the size uh, of, of your tank, this, the skimmer yeah. versus the total surface of the tank will have some balance. Yeah. The biggest tanks out there, if you're looking at a 160 or lower, almost certainly this is the only solution. In fact, it might work too well, and you might have to turn it off based on pH. Yeah. Uh, less effective on low end skimmers also. So the you know if you have a skimmer that probably you know draws 200 liters per air or per hour, these you I mean you can visually see the amount of air that your skimmer has when it's running at full blast because it'll just be this white cloud thick uh, in the body. Uh, but if your skimmer at full blast or if you have an AC and you plug it in and it doesn't uh, it doesn't have like a ton of foam white foam. Uh, then it's probably you know, a less air draw skimmer. Uh, even smaller bodies, uh, smaller body skimmers probably have a hard time too. The DC is a, the, one of the best options. I can adjust I, it. I can tell you right now, is uh, if you have a $150 skimmer, it's gonna suck less air than the 300 mm. in almost every case, mm. right? And I would say that the $150 one is almost always low. Sometimes the $300 ones are low too, yeah. uh, but like, if you're at the lowest end, it's probably sucking the least amount of air. Mm. But you can see it. It looks thin and whispery versus milky. Yep. So. yep. Uh, all right. Future ideas. Uh, and this is the thing that I'm actually testing on my own tank here is what if I didn't want to buy that media and I wanted it to last a lot longer recirculating? Mm. Okay. Just breathing its own CO2 scrubbed air. Yeah, so basically in this case, what we do is we suck media through the CO2 skimmer, or CO2 media feeds into the skimmer, and then the air has to leave. There's yeah. only one place it leaves, too. Out the top of that neck, and the little holes that are in the top of your lid. That's yep. where it leaves. What if we port that air back into the intake of the CO2 media? I already have CO2, or scrubbed CO2 air, and now I'm feeding scrubbed CO2 air back through this, uh, the CO2 media, meaning less consumption. Zero almost for me. Uh, I, 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 I couldn't, I never found, I have, it's been running for a while now, and I yeah. haven't found, I haven't had to change the media or even got any meaningful use of it. Not perpetual though, because there, there's probably, I mean, CO2 will end up somewhere in there, right? But I believe instead of a week, we're talking months. Hmm. Yeah, so like, were you, will, were you willing to change that $12 worth of media uh, four times a year? The amount of people willing to do that skyrockets. <laughs> yeah, but there's some hurdles to this recirculating idea that uh, we've got to get over as a community and, re and develop idea. this idea. So, and that's, the media gets wet. Uh, this is something that we're seeing right now on the 360. We had to, we only had one jumbo container and you can see, you know, from where it pulls that more, that air coming out of the top of the skimmers, you know, it's got humidity, it's moisture. Mm -hmm. And that moisture starts to travel up into the uh, media or into the actual media reactor. And now you're seeing w water pool up underneath and, and eventually even the humid inside the reactor to the point that the media gets wet. 
when you're whisking water and air together like that and recirculating it back through, I mean, in my mind, it's about to rain in there. Yeah, it's you just know, humid. Like 100% humidity, humidity water. Humidity. And you see both those things. A, on the bottom of the container, uh, you'll see water pool up, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and with the, the jumbo CO2 reactor that we make, it actually has a port on the bottom. To drain, yeah. yeah and so, like, I would use that one over, like, the fancy commercial acrylic ones every time for the sole purpose of the fact that I can just screw the cap off and drain the water, water out, out, where yeah. the other ones don't allow you to do that, and you have to re disassemble the whole thing. Otherwise, the water is going to go right up into the media and mm -hmm. cause all kinds of problems. But... but you could do the, same, the other thing that we're trying. Well, actually, I wanted to share one other thing before yeah. we get there. So the reason that I, I actually uh, took it apart is because I was noticing that the color change never happened in the mm, media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when I switched to the recirculating design, and at first I was like, ah, oh, well, it's, it's probably because it's not yeah. consuming anything. Yeah. Uh, but then after that, uh, I decided to change the media to something else that had like a, a more permanent color change, and it didn't do it either. Mm. But when I took it out, it was like wet. Yeah. Like that, 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 and it's basically what it is the media in there is calcium, calcium hydroxide. Hydrox. It's Kalk like calcwasser pellets, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, With binding agents. Yeah, and so what it was, it was just wet in there because there's so much humidity in there. And so we just did this, I think it was like yesterday. Yeah, yesterday or day before, yeah. Uh, we decided to take a different uh, approach, and I don't know if this will work or not, but what we decided to do is add a second cartridge to it with uh, some media. And right now we're using sponges, but we might try bio balls, we might try bio bale, we might try a bunch of different things to see if we can get the moisture Capture. to collect on a yeah. surface and then drip off. Uh, and collect water in that first canister, get some of the humidity out before it goes into the yeah. media. I will let you know whether or not that works. Yeah, because if that doesn't work, I mean, we'll have to try uh, venting it to some degree, which, you know, then you're yeah. pulling air from the ambient room and defeating the recirculating process. Dissicants probably will will yeah, just wear like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could, yeah, it'd probably be hard. Uh, one of the things, though, the reasons that I'm trying it this way is actually on uh, Reef to Reef, I saw a thread where somebody did this, and they actually stopped doing it because they said it stripped up too much of the water and then hurt the performance of the media. Mm. I gotta be honest, I have a really hard time believing that they would strip out that much water just by having you know, air in oh, there like yeah. that, going over a media, but I'm hopeful mm. that it actually does. Yeah. And I don't think too much is actually a thing here. Yeah. So uh, we will find out and I will let you know how it works. But. Uh, the CO2 sh recirculating thing. Another one here is uh, a problem with it is, I wouldn't call this a problem, but you should be aware of it, is limited oxygen exchange now. Hmm. Uh, so if your number one oxygen exchange mechanism, uh, the, the skimmer, uh, is now just recirculating its own air, then we're kind of like, which is, which is doing more, the surface agitation on the top of the tank or the skimmer? Yeah. So the reason I, I bring this up, just to make sure that's into awareness, because we're talking about future ideas, we're not talking about facts here, we're talking about as a community, we're going to learn something. Mm -hmm. I mean, on my tank, I think the gas exchange on the surface of the water is more than adequate to sustain the oxygen levels inside of the aquarium. I don't right. need the yeah. skimmer to be able to do that, because i got tons of flow, it's rolling. Uh, so decide that for yourself. But if you... Uh, have 8 million fish in there and you think you have an oxygen problem already, well, recirculating the skimmer means that one of the primary gas exchanges is no longer going to do that for you. Yeah. It's not for that purpose anymore. It's a primary purpose now is turds and, and, raising, uh, pH. and raising the pH. Oxygen is no longer in that <laughs> matrix. Uh, another f uh, part of this or a hurdle for the recirculating idea is that risk of skimmer overflows. You think about what happens when your skimmer gets uh, uh, just goes crazy, overfills the cup, and then starts bubbling and whatnot on the top? Well, guess where that poopy water's going? Yeah, if your skimmer, for whatever reason, the air thing gets clogged, or the water level in your sump goes up, and all of a sudden it's you know flowing, all of a sudden now all that water is going to get sucked into the, the uh, CO2, CO2 media. media. It's going to get wet. It's super high pH. Kalkwasser uh, pellets. You really got to think about in your specific design because there isn't. This is all DIY at this point. Right, right, right. Uh, like, 
how would th that work for you and what are the dangers? And think of every terrible like, thing that could happen because it will probably happen yeah. in a long enough timeline. I got a suspicion. I don't know. I don't know where this is going to land. I, I got a suspicion that I'm going to find that I would prefer to just change out the media every couple of weeks and my solution will be get the biggest container. I would like to get a container big enough that it will last me a month right. and just change it out once a month. But the 40 box set compared to the amount of coral that goes in there a month isn't going to be relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, it will have its payoff. I'm not sure if I'm going to get past the whole the humidity problem and all of that stuff. We'll see. We'll see. I, I'm, I'm, I would right. desperately like. I it. walked by it earlier today, and I saw that the actual the chamber uh, after all of the foam pads that we put in uh, it does look pretty dry. It does. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see. We'll see if water collects in there anymore, <clears throat> uh, and we'll see if the water turns to mud. And if you follow my Facebook, uh, you'll actually get probably updates every few days to every week or so <laughs> on how it's going. Uh, another thing it does is head pressure. So recirculating through two canisters, through some drying media, and then back through the other media is going to, and I definitely had to crank up the DC skimmer to compensate for the fact that I'm sucking through all mm -hmm. this media. In fact, we didn't, after we added the second one, we didn't, and the skimmer stopped working. Like, it's still foaming, but it's not producing anything. So I might right. have to go turn it up a few more points mm. again. Yeah. Uh, so when might this be a good option for somebody uh, using a scrubber? Uh, when the outside air, uh, running a fresh, uh, a fresh air line isn't gonna, an option. Uh, when coral growth and health matters more than the cost of the media. Uh, and when you want the satisfaction of pegging, being able to peg the pH, it's another one of those uh, it's like our filtration. We now have the ability to dial this thing in. I now have the ability to dial in my pH. So I want to clarify there <clears throat> that like we talked a lot about the recirculating piece. That's like what I'd call experimental. So when is uh, this? Is, when is the scrubber just normal scrubber that you replace it every week or so the best option? It's when your coral and health growth matters. Uh, it's also in. It doesn't defy, uh, defy the cost. And the real that that last piece you said, yeah, the a satisfying thing of I can peg this thing. Mine's eight point three all the time. <laughs> Let me show you my chart. Yeah. You know? Oh man. Yeah. All right. So, next one, two part. All right. Chemistry solutions to uh, managing to the managing pH, pH. And the acidity. All right, what's good about two-part? Good two-part. Uh, first one is two-part is the number one additive that most of you are using already. So why not pick an option that uh, helps solve pH, you know, this, the soda ashes of the world, the tritons of the world, these, you know, alkalinity portions that uh, actually have a pH boosting effect, can help buffer some of that pH. You're using two-part anyway. Why not use it? Yeah. Pick one. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the good part of it is it does a really good job of boosting the pH in your tank, and you're already dosing some. You might as well do it. Uh, some of them, the good part, actually, some of them do it better than others. So some of them do it way better than the one that you're using right now. Some don't uh, do it at all. Some of them do it worse, actually, too. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can adjust it to, to dose when needed, meaning... Like I could choose to, you know, during the day your pH is naturally high because the lights are on and all the corals and, and everything yeah. are sucking up carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. well, I could choose to dose at night to balance the whole thing out. And so one of the things you'll do though when you balance the whole thing at night out is it actually raises the pH during the day too because like at the start of the day if it's my pH is 7.8, well, yeah. you're gonna take a long time to get it to 8.3. If, if I start I, at 8.1, Boom, it doesn't take any time. Yep, 100%. Yeah, so doing that at night sometimes, if you can get it to not go all the way that low, actually may be better than trying to like peak mm. it just only during the day. Because if you dose it during the day versus night, what happens is you get these really extreme peaks, man. Remember when we said earlier on in the show, which was a tenth of a point was a 26% change in, in acidity, or acidity? Acidity. So what's the difference between 7.8 and 8.3? <sighs> Huge. Massive. So it might be better that uh, instead of really shooting for high during the day, 
is allow it to not go as low by dosing your two-part and stuff at night. So. Uh, bad part about dosing two-part for this purpose of raising pH, many of those options are, have a limited to no effect on pH or the reef tank uh, acidification, meaning that a lot, of, uh, a lot of the options are sodium bicarbonate, in which case uh, not really much there for pH boost. There isn't. Yeah. Uh, so, like, there's a lot of commercial options out there that they're just easier to use if they don't have a net effect on pH. They're less risky mm. and they're really designed for beginners. So, like, if you're using a, a two part uh, that doesn't have an effect on the pH, I mean, literally, it was designed for somebody mm. that is entering the hobby, not the advanced yeah, crowd. It's easy to tell. Like, typically, there's a white cloud versus no white cloud. Yeah, I mean. The, or dose it next to your pH probe yeah, and see if it goes up. Yeah, you, you should be able to tell pretty quickly. Uh, uh, and uh, the better, OK, so one of the bad things here is the better the two-part raises the, or the more the two-part raises the pH, the more dangerous it is. <laughs> yeah. Dangerous for you and the tank, yeah, or, and the, yourself. Like overdose, uh, you know, overdosing uh, uh, soda ash, uh, you're gonna see your pH, you possibly see your pH go way beyond what we want it to be. Kalkwasser is kind of another, we're gonna get to Kalkwasser too, but uh, these P high pH boosting ones. So often what will happen is if you overdose, you know, alkalinity, you'll create a precipitation. Like if I just overdosed bicarb, like a low, a low effect in mm. pH, it actually just create a precipitation event and the alkalinity will go up, uh, but it won't probably nuke the tank as fast. Yeah. Uh, if I had a problem and I was dosing soda ash or something like a Triton or something way higher pH, well, it's not just the alkalinity that's going up now, it's pH. the pH is skyrocketing, which is way more likely to crash the tank. Yeah. So you got to be a little bit more careful with these solutions. Uh, a pH controller, though, does it for you and alarms you. So yeah. like, yep. it's super easy to, to get around. But you got to be aware that you're looking for that kind of thing. Uh, but also, it's the more dangerous it is to you as a person, too. So like, mm. uh, you know, some people use things all the way as extreme as lye. Yeah, oh, know, yeah, sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide. And... It like literally has a skull and crossbones on it. <laughs> uh, and if you've watched uh, Fight Club, you know exactly what it does to your hand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, great for pH, not good for your hand. <laughs> uh, yeah, so maybe that was a little extreme in Novi, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, all the same, it, it says literally will kill you um, yeah. uh, if you go by lye or sodium hydroxide. So I don't want to find out. Yeah, probably not either. Uh, what's the next uh, bad one? Uh, another bad one is it doesn't work well if you have low calcium and alkalinity demand tanks, uh, which you're limited by, like how much demand of calcium and alkalinity you have will limit how much you can dose to your tank. So if you're doing the, you know, if you pick the soda ash or you pick the Triton uh, for its pH boosting effect, you're dosing it at night and uh, you just, are, you, you stopped your pH at nine and you're shooting for a nine DKH, uh, you know, if 50 mils a day is what it takes to maintain 9 dKH in your tank, uh, this might not be an option for you because it, the dose is so little that it might not have as much of an effect. It might not have it hardly effect. To boil it down in my own terms here, uh, like my own tank, I don't got any corals in the tank yet. So you couldn't uh, do this. I don't really need to dose much of anything other than the coralline yeah. algae uptake just at the moment. Just keep climbing it, and climbing alkalinity. I can't dose anything two part to the tank for any minimum amount, it won't work. So it won't work that great for people that are, you know, do, using two part to increase the pH won't work that great when you buy a bunch of little frags. It will work really great when those great frags grow out. Yeah, you yeah. Know? So it's kind of the nature of how do I get to where I want to go, <laughs> <laughs> you know, on the way there. Uh, all right. And future ideas, right? So we just talked, uh, like, part of the DIY community originally went from baking soda. Mm -hmm. They started baking the baking soda. Mm -hmm. And then we figured out that you could just buy soda ash instead of baking baking soda in the oven. Right. Well, uh, I think a few years ago, the, like, the next generation was like, oh, well, let's use sodium hydroxide or lye, you know, to get the pH boost even higher. 
Uh, people actually asked us to bring in like a pharmaceutical grade of sodium lye. Sodium hydroxide, yeah. Uh, and my answer is uh, I don't feel comfortable selling that to people because of the danger to your family, your kids, and yeah. yourself. And it's not just one day, man. You have to have really good chemical practices to mm -hmm. never burn yourself or hurt your eyes mm -hmm. or lungs or yeah. I, I, don't, I don't see it. However, one of the future ideas uh, is, I don't know, people could sell pre-dissolved sodium hydroxide solutions, which may be safer than dry. Mm. So if it's already dissolved in the water and you don't have to have all those perfect chemistry, uh, you know, behavior of, you know, yeah. always add the, you know, acid to water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, you know, water Safety, to, yeah. Uh, acid, yeah, acid to water, yeah, goggles, not gloves. water to acid. Oh, you know, uh, yeah. ventilator probably to some, you know, when you're pouring the stuff in there. Yeah. If somebody already had it in a pre-made solution, that's just less chance of me screwing it up as Joe Blow in my house. So I've always wondered if actually the Triton one is at least partially sodium hydroxide because the Triton one uh, has the highest pH increase. Mm. So if you're looking for, uh, we're actually going to do an investigates on this pretty soon, but well, you'll be able to see exactly what the pH increase in your tank is of one DKH increase from all the popular two parts out there. Yeah. I'm pretty darn certain that it's the Triton that it has the highest uh, uh, pH increase. So if you're looking for that already, you can just go get that one. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's incorporated sodium hydroxide, at least partially, mm. uh, in the matrix to get where they're going because they're doing something that is increasing the pH much more than everybody else. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, there are some other salts and stuff in there. Like, so the cool thing about Triton actually is like some people can you know, fool the whole test kit. Like you could add like a bunch of borate salts to uh, increase oh, the pH yeah, yeah. artificially. And then like you would get really high pH with borate salt, but it would build up because nothing in the tank consumes borate that fast. Yeah, so you but run your Triton test and borate. That's the thing is the accountability of Triton here mm. is that they also tell you to test the stuff and so you would, if, you if would it was see formulated it. like that, it would tell you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that's pretty cool, yeah, actually. Okay, so uh, when is two-part a good option? Anybody who wants to use two-part, there you go. Easy peasy. Dose it at night. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, I... Two-part is a good option for raising your pH to anybody that uses two-part, which is a vast, vast majority of you. Yeah. Uh, so just pick one. Uh, soda ash is probably the most popular, most popular, mm. most uh, uh, affordable uh, and readily available option out there. Uh, a lot of the retail ones you'll find do less than soda ash, and then I think there's Triton on the other end. Mm -hmm. All right, Kalkwasser. Alquasser. What's good? Option number five of ten. Uh, good. Raises pH uh, more than most two parts. Like you can, I, I've done this. I, every time I had my ATO kick off when I had Kalkwasser running in it, I could see my pH on my uh, Apex graph go whoosh, skyrocket down. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it will boost the pH more than most two parts. Because it's also like the lye is a uh, hydroxide, mm -hmm. in this case, sodium hydroxide, which isn't, uh, or calcium, calcium hydroxide, hydroxide, which isn't as dangerous. <laughs> uh, you can't, you can't uh, kiss your hand and burn yourself. <laughs> uh, so uh, <clears throat> another good one, though, is it hits a good reason for kelk is uh, beyond the pH, man, it hits calcium and alkalinity all in one solution. One part solution. I'm yeah. ready to go. pH, calcium, alkalinity. Uh, It'll take you a long way. You know, I didn't put this in here, but remind me of one of the bad, well, I'll just share it right now. One of the bad things, though, because you're doing calcium, alkalinity, and all this stuff in one, is sometimes people use it, dose it during the day, mm. as like they tie it to the evaporator, or they're like auto top off yeah. and stuff, yeah. and you evaporate more in the day. And then what happens is the pH just skyrockets so high during yeah. the day. So right. another another reason not to use it in your ATO. Yeah, skipping a skipping a bad yeah. here. So another good one. Kalkwasser can also be again dosed at the time of day that's needed for stability. So we talk about uh, in some of our Kalkwasser conversations, we talked about uh, ditching the ATO reservoir altogether, so you're not tied to that uh, one mechanism of evaporation, but instead using a dosing pump and a reservoir. And you know, 
uh, accurately dosing. Like I want 50 mils, I want a thousand mils a day of Kalkwasser solution. Well, now that I have a way to tell how much I need, I can also tell it when to do it, which means I can do it at night. So basically, you just mix your Coke cluster up with water. It creates a stable solution that maintains its potency. Those 2,000 milliliters a day, and it's stable just like two parts. Yeah. Then, then you can do it during the day. You can do it at night. You can do it whenever you want. Tell you. Uh, just hook up a dosing pump. <laughs> Uh, another good option for a kelp is uh, it's super cheap. It's one of the cheapest ways to manage calcium alkalinity and, uh, you know, also pH. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, super cheap, resonates with a lot of people. <laughs> uh, it's really easy and cheap. Very All easy. All right, what are the bads? Uh, one of the things that's bad about kelp to do the dosing uh, at a specific rate and time usually requires a large container next to the tank for uh, or frequent filling of the tank. So uh, for me, I had a 25 gallon brute trash can next to my tank and that's what I dosed the Kalkwasser off, uh, out of. Typically lasts me about three weeks. Yeah, this isn't two part where you're dosing uh, 100 milliliters, yeah. you're dosing couple two thousand. liters. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or even a couple gallons of water a day <clears throat> in some cases. So. Mm. It requires a large container next to the tank that a lot of people don't have. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, reactors, there's an option where you can like pump water through a reactor that spins. Uh, these things are expensive, and I got to be honest, not all that reliable. Yeah, no, I, you can you can still set it up to doses, but a very specific amount. But monitoring the saturation and when it's you know not working and working, and a lot of times you know some of those stir bars get clogged if they're not a continuous uh, continuous duty stir bar. Yeah. The only one I ever liked uh, was, I think it's called. A Vast now. Marine one? No, it's the Aquamedic old one. Mm. Yeah, a little stir bar. Uh, the problem with the, the stir bar just continuously spins just fast enough to keep it mixed and the water goes through it, right? Yeah. Uh, and it, my pro that one worked really well. I could put a lot of kelk water in there and it would still stay sturdy and it wouldn't, like, water, especially the big one, water and slurry wouldn't go out the top. Yeah, just clear uh, solution. The, the motor was really easy to replace and available. Uh, it, it was the right solution for me. Every other one that I've used, jams on the bottom, mm -hmm. doesn't spin, crusts up, stays cloudy, doesn't actually spin that much, and you need to be real careful about how much you put in there, mm. and I hate it. <laughs> I, I, I just like, I, I, every other one that I've ever used has not been right for me, and I really don't like the ones that use a pump to mix the slurry, because you have to uh, like Wait put for it on it timers, yeah. let it settle, you're mm -hmm. not right, it's just, it's totally unnecessary. Right. Large container. All right. Uh, it doesn't work well if you have, again, a low calcium and alkalinity demand tank uh, and you're limited by calcium and alkalinity demand. So, you know, you can put a max saturation solution on your tank, uh, but if you don't need to dose, you know, 1,000 to 2,000 mils a day uh, and you're at, you know, 100, 500 mils a day of Kalkwasser, that might not be the uh, pH boost uh, that you're looking for. All right, future ideas in Kalkwasser. Dosing right. slurry. Okay, so everything I've ever been told... Don't do that. ...is don't dose Kalkwasser slurry. Yep, right? I've heard the same. You mix it up, you let it sell out, and then you dose the lime water on the top. Yes. Okay, so recently there's been this like wave of people dosing slurry, and I'm really interested about people that are doing yeah. this uh, because... Like it will definitely increase the pH like way more than dosing the lime Just water. The lime water, yeah. I'm not really sure if it's also dosing more al alkalinity and calcium at the same mm -hmm. time, but there are three challenges here that we're gonna have to get past to 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 do that. Yeah. And like some of them, people aren't thinking about when they do it. Uh, one is it's a challenge to get a reliable dose out of the slurry. So right. I might have more liquid than uh, actual particulate or vice versa. So then is my thousand mils really a thousand mils or what have you? The potency of the slurry changes yeah. uh, as it's exposed to carbon dioxide mm -hmm. or as it goes up. If, like, if, it, if you're dosing it and then refilling it back with more fresh water, the potency is going to change. Mm -hmm. The amount of the slurry in the water is gonna change the potency. It just becomes like a really big unknown that, like, if you control it really well in the beginning, sure, dude, but this seems like destined for problems all yeah. the time. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, you, you could try it. Uh, 
Yeah, the this, second one. Yeah, this next one uh, is one that I'd be worried about, and that's impurities in most of the kalkwassers. If you, you know, farm, if you're not getting like the pharma grade uh, type materials, and you know, is there even something in some of the, in some of the pharma grade ones that are allowed through? But if you're uh, off over the counter, if you're getting Mrs. Wages, uh, dosing yeah. the slurry, who knows what's in there? We do know. Actually, we did we the it. we did the ICP <laughs> MS testing yep. on it. You know, she sent this stuff out to a real lab, man. It Settling had sent cones, back. the whole nine. Yeah, and dude, and like, there's the pharma stuff that uh, BRS uses, and then all the rest of it. I think it's just food grade. Mm. Uh, and like, dude, it had like 20 parts per million silica, had arsenic in it, it had uh, aluminum in it, like a lot. Mm. It had like all kinds of stuff in there. You absolutely don't want in your tank. Now the super high potency of the slurry, uh, or when you mix it up and then let it settle out, is the benefit is all that copper and everything in there it stays. It down. actually precipitates out and stays in the bottom. If you're dosing the slurry, you're gonna dose all that stuff to your tank. Mm -hmm. So if you do it, use the pharma for a gosh sake. Uh, <laughs> uh, the only argument you could have is like, well, maybe it stays as precipitate in the slurry when you get in the tank. Maybe, Who but knows? why would you ever like? If why would you ever want to intentionally arsenic. dose silica, arsenic, aluminum, and all this other garbage to the tank, and then just hope that it's not going to build up and release into the tank? If, when three years, four years, five years down the road, you see some events that are going on, like what the hell? I don't no. Know. No. Nobody looks that far back. To uh, we buy the stuff we buy actually for ours is like actually designed for baby formula. It's a totally different standard. You can see in the ICP. Go watch the Kelkwasser uh, like uh, the ICP ICP test. results. You can, yeah, you yeah. Can, I mean, the, the differences and the, like there were some differences in a bunch of the other medias. This one was the most stark. Uh, <laughs> and like when you read uh, Randy Holmes of Fowler's articles, he's like, "Yeah, dude, there's definitely impurities in this food grade stuff. But you don't have to worry about because you let it settle out." It changes the game if you're going to actually dose, dose that stuff. stuff to the mm -hmm. tank. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, stray particles are not good for organic tissue. So, so you're dosing it and it gets now it's blowing around your tank to the little sensitive polyps on the corals. Yeah, wherever those little slurly particles that aren't dissolved yet are, they're going to land in gills. They're going to, mm. you know, like people, the fish are breathing this, you know. Uh, it's going to land on the tissue, any organic tissue, that super high pH particles are not good. Yeah. So, uh, uh, caustic. It's, it's also undissolved particles, like <laughs> dosing them into areas like your uh, like return pump. Well, now those undissolved particles are also going to hit like a ceramic on ceramic shaft and start to deteriorate mm. uh, the bearings on your pumps and stuff too. So, slurry method. Uh, if you can't tell, not my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> There's it has some things to be learned from it. I be cautious of those things. Yeah, but there's pioneers out there. Uh, we wouldn't get anywhere in this hobby if there weren't pioneers first. So sometimes yeah. they get shot in the back. Sometimes they find greener pastures. Here's the piece, though. Like, don't ignore the issues that are attached to this. Embrace them. A pioneer will embrace and solve them. They yeah. won't just go marching off into territories. Uh, well, yeah. Those ones never come back. <laughs> uh, the ones that, like the pioneers and the thought leaders that come back, are the ones that know what they're fighting and uh, know to what to look it. for yeah. and know how to avoid it. Mm. So. So when is Kalkwasser a good option uh, for anyone who, with the space for a container and the willingness to buy a dosing pump? I, Dude, that's all I you need. A container. I, I, I will put uh, the 360 on Kelkwasser. I will use this uh, all the time. Especially, I didn't like it when I was mixing two parts. People used to ask all the time, can you mix two part in Kelkwasser? And I was like, well, if you're using it and you're out of top off, you're mixing you know, yeah. evaporation, you got two different you know, uptakes. But if and I'm dosing, sort of stuff. yeah. Yeah, but if I'm dosing a known quantity of the lime water mm -hmm. or the dissolved water on the top, I know its potency, I'm doing 2,000 milliliters a day, I, that will be the first thing I use, and then I'll build on top of that yeah. in many cases, especially when cost and ease of use is a priority. Mm -hmm. So anybody willing to buy a dosing bump, pump capable of doing uh, you know, the amount of water you need to do in a day reliably, uh, and has space for a container near the tank, Kelk Washer is a great option for you. Yeah, 100%. Next we'll, one. We'll get to see what, uh, how far Kelk Washer takes Ryan's tank.
Yeah, it'd be really Wouldn't interesting. That be fun? Yeah. yeah. Uh, next option for this pH issue in solving reef tank acidification, uh, refugium or scrubber is another option. And we've seen this in our own testing of refugiums way back when, where that one tank with the uh, horticulture specific light with the Kessel on there reached pHs of like 9.0 in the nines. Mm -hmm. That was obvious that this pH thing is being solved by that. So uh, good and bad uh, and some future ideas for the refugium scrubber. One of the first good ones is it also solves, it not, to, not only solves pH, but it solves nutrients in the tank. It's a filter. This is another good mix. <coughs> like, uh, mm -hmm. so, hey, the CO2 scrubber doesn't get me all the way there. The two part doesn't get me all the way there. Well, combined with a uh, refugium, it does. Yeah. Ah. It's inherently Win -win. used at night, so it slows down the progress at the bottom end of the whole deal. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've got some uh, notes on some bad, too, uh, additional notes. But yeah. uh, also super easy to install and ongoing use. I mean, it, for the scrubber that, you put on, or that we're going to put on your tank, the scrubber I have on my tank, it's pump in water, uh, return, drain down, and light the light, and I'm good to go. The scrubber, super simple to input. Scrape off the algae once in a while. Yeah. Uh, once a week. Also, is it? also refugium. Yeah. Uh, I never use a scrubber. I've been doing mine more frequently because I have extremely high phosphates, and the more frequent I, you know, scrape my slime. I'm growing slime rather than at hair algae. And according to some articles I read, slime is actually good. You just have to har harvest it more, more oh, frequently. So. Uh, I've been harvesting my, my slime more frequently than uh, I was doing it once a week. Now I'm doing it like every couple of days, every few days, just scraping it off. But that's actively getting rid of some of my excess nutrients. So for those of the, you that hung with and somehow don't know the difference, I'm sure, <laughs> uh, a refugium is generally just a big vat full of catomorpha, right? Yep. A scrubber is a screen that grows hair algae or slime. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, most likely, most people are looking for a sheet of, uh, of hair algae. And then with the refugium, you come by once in a while. It's kind of like actually those plants that grow in your house. Like we were talking about getting a million plants in your house. Yeah. Uh, we're just growing plants in the sump now. The sump, and it will suck out the CO2, uh, bind it up into the tissue. I'll come and grab some, and I'll throw it in the trash. Done and did. Right? Scrubber, same thing in theory. Yeah. So uh, some of them are a little bit different than each other. Well, this is that uh, another point where you can mix and match some of the things. So, you know, running your, your scrubber at night, like we were saying with uh, dosing uh, alkalinity at night, you know, is a way to... Re reduce the ga the mountain that pH uh, class to climb during the day when photosynthesis is happening. So I'm not falling to you know seven point or seven point eight or seven point seven at night because my refugium's keeping my pH up. So when the lights turn on and everything starts photosynthesizing, you know I'm only going from like eight point one to eight point three. Yep. Super easy to install. Super easy on going use. And a cool part about the refugium too is controllable with a good light. Meaning uh, I can actually tune how much CO2 I'm sucking out of the water by increasing or decreasing the photosynthetic energy uh, either in the length of time the light's on mm -hmm. or uh, the intensity of the light. Yeah, if I don't have the power of the sun, then I'm going to grow plant, plants slower. And one of the things actually we're going to share in a video in the future is actually pH uh, is probably the best indication of how well your C or your scrubber uh, or CO or your uh, refugium is actually working. Meaning, if uh, I crank up the lights a little higher and uh, the pH actually goes up, it means there's mo more photosynthesis going on, and that the plant isn't actually shutting down or uh, like uh, mm. bleach or not bleaching, but. Uh, protecting itself yeah. from the light. So you can actually kind of turn it up until you hit a point where that happens. Acclimation mode on some of the fancy lights might actually be really helpful Ramp it that. up slowly, yeah. And you can watch the CO2, or you can watch your pH chart. So like, the pH is actually probably an, a leading indicator to how much nitrate and phosphate you're gonna pull out. Absolutely. <laughs> so tunable just by length of hours as well as intensity, which makes this a great tool for a pH. You can actually tune it to your needs and it isn't complex, doesn't rely a bunch of, on a bunch of solenoids or anything else. So let's talk about the cons of the, or the bad side of the scrubber, some things to think about. One, we found here on the 160, that thing is a detritus trap, uh, like drains go drain straight into the refugium chamber. There's no uh, mechanical filtration before the refugium chamber, in which case all the uneaten food, all the fish poo 
down in the uh, gets caught within the web of the Cato, gets uh, stuck on the bottom because there's not nothing down there kicking it up or keeping it going through the rest of the filtration. So detritus trap. It is a mess, man. It becomes the tank's toilet after a while. Oh, when we harvest the 160 and you start messing with that ball of Kato, the tank clouds up in front because gotta, it's just holding on to so much. You got to turn the tank off. Yeah. Man. Uh, turn the return off before you clean it and let it settle again because it will, it's, it's just like a net. Uh, it just collects all the garbage yeah. in the tank. There are some ways around that. Uh, like, so. One of the things is I don't think you really need to have uh, your Catomorpha bed this thick. You can actually <laughs> probably make it only four inches thick. Yeah. I can put to some pumps in there that will spin it, you know, like a gyre. If you want it to spin like the Death Star, in most cases you're either going to like have to build some kind of DIY rotisserie yep. uh, or uh -huh. you're going to have to put like sheets of water like the gyres will really make it spin and keep the detritus off the bottom and flow will also keep the detritus out of you know the mesh of it mm -hmm. as well so you can get ways around it but just left to its own devices uh, just throwing it in there it is a giant trap this is also another bad, I don't, this is one like I would like if somebody out there uses scrubbers and I'm curious what your opinion is mm. on this. I read somewhere that the scrubber, which is that sheet of water uh, or sheet that grows the hair algae on it and water trickles over it, tends to take atmospheric gas out, meaning it's mm. sucking CO2 out of the air surrounding it rather than the water. But this is just something that I read on a forum once mm. and I, I haven't actually found that out. So. This is a potential bad with the scrubber is that it may not pull out as much CO2 out of the water as it does from the air. I mean, it's plausible in my, in my opinion, for sure, in that, uh, you know, the plant in the refugium is growing underwater, typically in a large, uh, in a much larger, much more surface area. So you imagine that there's, you know, the amount of photosynthesis in the refugiums probably greatly more than on my, you know, six inch by six inch screen. Uh, and the thing's not hermetically sealed, it's not completely sealed. So, you know, the air that does get in there can or the CO2 that does get in there could be the, uh, from my surrounding room. Uh, it'd be interesting to just put these things side by side in the we're test, gonna. which we're going to do. Yeah, we're gonna do an experiment on this one, share with you guys, uh, get the actual you know, Just watch the it. pH data. There's gonna be a, multiples of data that we can find on it, but pH will be one of the most interesting. It'll be a different, does it do it at all? And does it do it better than X? Uh, I, here's the one thing though, I've learned is plausible theory, even though it makes all of our heads nod, doesn't make it doesn't true. always work out. Doesn't yeah. not make it true, man. In fact, it's like a, it's such a big danger, man. Like this whole conversation we've had today is plausible theory is that anywhere between seven point eight and eight point three is okay. Well, it's just wrong. Yep. It was just dead, dead wrong. So for uh, years, <laughs> it, for there, there are so many downsides to something we just didn't know. Plausible theory, like five people raise their hand and say the same thing at the same time, suddenly makes it a fact in our <laughs> hobby. It's just not true. So I say this as a concern, doesn't mean it's true necessarily. Mm. We're gonna find out and give you the actual answer mm. uh, in the upcoming months. Uh, another one. Another one of refugium and scrubbers is they do require some limited maintenance. Uh, again, with the scrubber, yeah. Uh, the initial advice was every three days. I think actually Josh, uh, the Clearwater Scrubbers, Josh, he says uh, more along the lines of once per week. I let, so let that kind of grow. Um, uh, the refugium, again, if you're collecting detritus, you're going to have to vacuum the sump, that portion of the sump out, clean outs. Maybe you pull the whole ball of Kato out every once in a while and dunk, dunk it and rinse it in a five-gallon bucket of uh, salt water or what have you. But, and then you're walking by and pulling you know, chunks out. But there is some maintenance to each one of these. So one of the, uh, I put this as bad, but it's good and bad, uh, is it sucks up elements. So... Your refugiums and scrubbers can muck up your chemistry, mm. right? Good and bad, I guess. Yeah, and the more, the harder they're working, the better they are at sucking up uh, uh, Nitrates uh, and phosphates. carbon dioxide yeah. out of the tank and nitrate and phosphate, the more cobalt or magnesium or, or magnanese and more molybdenum and more yeah. iron they're going to pull out as well. 
These are all photosynthetic organisms. The, the faster they grow, the more of that stuff they're going to soak right up. Also, though, uh, I had a, jo a conversation with Josh at Clearwater, which is it pulls out like heavy metals. You don't know it, but a lot of the additives that you're using, you know, they're like tech grade and they have like a bunch of, you know, cobalt and they have a, a bunch of nickel, nic all, all kinds yeah. of impurities in mm. there that just like are unintentional and build up in there. Uh, and so, and like foods like have copper and stuff in them. So like if you fed a normal amount, it might not be issue, but if you feed a tons of them, it, like the copper level might be more than intended. Mm. Well, the hair algae on the scrubber and maybe to some degree the ketomorpha Josh swears that the, the hair algae in the scrubber will do this way better. <laughs> but suck <laughs> up some of test. the unintended things, another thing we'll test. Uh, and probably to some degree ammonia too. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. You had a fish death or... Uh, uh, yeah, it's interesting. So understand the bad. The reason I put this as bad is because... You have to account for these things now. It has an unintended uh, app, uh, effect on the mm. chemistry of the water. You're maintaining trace elements uh, for your corals and you're competing or you're competing with your refugium or scrubber. So let me tell you two, a couple of different ways that I would address this, by the way. One, uh, there's only one two part out there and it just boggles the mind that nobody has followed this suit. But there's only one two-part out there that actually accounts for this, and it's uh, Triton. Mm. The Triton method is all designed around the fact that uh, it refugium uses gonna do refugiums. This. Yeah. So they add more of that stuff to uh, the two-part than anybody else does. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, Brightwell sells Cato Grow, which has all the things that your tank or you know the macroalgae sucks up, and you can kind of just dose it. Now. How would you know if this is happening? I'm gonna give you two ways. <laughs> uh, one, you could do ICP and then it'll give you a real pulse, like a pretty solid window into the chemistry of the tank. Mm -hmm. Okay, not everyone wants to send a $50 test kit. Uh, no, multiple times. Yeah, so then there's another one. It's just looking for the precursor. So Red Sea and maybe somebody else sells a iron test yeah, kit. Leading indicators, yeah. Yeah, so if iron is getting artificially depleted in your tank and you just do the one test kit, you can just assume that a bunch of other things are going down as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and like, by the way, the zooxanthellae also a plant uh, needs these things to grow. So you're starving out the corals or what the, the organism the corals depend on. Mm. So it is important. Uh, and so, you know, this is one of the downsides to a refugium, even though, man, those things are super easy to maintain and they're awesome and I would put one on any tank. Yeah. Be aware of that issue. <laughs> uh, you solve it, Cato Grow, solve it with uh, Triton, Test solve it. it with water changes, whatever you want to do, but at least embrace the fact that this problem exists. Yeah. Uh, in low nutrient tanks, you might have to dose nitrogen and phosphorus uh, or nitrate and phosphate for the best performance on pH. So uh, neonitro, neophos, uh, this thing is growing, sucking out all that stuff like crazy. Uh, to keep that train rolling, if you will, you might have to subsidize or, uh, with some nitrate and phosphate dosing. You know, I I'm, I'm gonna, I hope I'm not butchering this, but I think that Josh told me the same thing about uh, scrubber. the scrubber is like, if you're low on one or the other one, you may have to dose the other one to actually keep up because the thing works too damn good, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it works in such a small place too. I love my scrubber. Yeah, uh, okay. So when is a refugium or a scrubber a good option? Uh, greenhouse the air above the fuser, the skimmer. So, oh, oh, future idea. I'm oh, sorry. that's a future idea. Future idea. It's like uh, tenting your scrubber or your fuge. Okay, so this is, I remember, you got, the, you got the scrubber, right? So what if we could improve on a couple of different things here? Okay. So uh, we got the scrubber, and we also have a, or a, a fuge. But we also have our CO2 uh, media mm -hmm. or our skimmer solution. What if we like tented the refugium <laughs> on top of it? Like just put a little like box on top of the refugium or on top of the scrubber where all that air presumably is really low CO2 and we recirculate the air the only above mm. uh, the area above the, uh, the refugium. Interesting. Because it's releases, you know, it'll be releasing oxygen into the ambient air from that point above the refugium, right? Uh, 
Well, it would be less CO2 anyway. Okay, wait, wait, wait. This just came to me. <laughs> Why do we even need the CO2 media? If I can... Why if can't I, I just recirculate my own skimmer? Mm -hmm. well, I, you know, some of the problems I see is... Because I'm not, I'm not going to strip out CO2 in that case, but I'm going to stop adding it with the skimmer. Right. If I started feeding from the top of the skimmer right into the sump. I'm feeling out this in real time. Mm -hmm. So I'm dying to know if you guys, what do you guys think of this idea? I see some hurdles in the lighting aspect in that... No, I skip the scrubber now. We're going back in time. No scrubber, no oh, refugium. Yeah. Why can't I just take the air coming out of the top of my skimmer and feed, it, feed it back, back to into the self. skimmer? I won't get any of the oxygen benefit, but I don't have any of the stupid uh, uh, moisture problems, and I, and I won't be stripping any CO2 out or anything, but mm. uh, I won't be adding any of the CO2 from the air either. Mm. It'd be interesting to just uh, knowing that we have a heavy CO2 laden office right here, if we just recirculate the 160 like today and put it back into its own lid and found out if, uh, since we're not drawing more for ambient CO2, if there is an increase. It's a pretty easy it. test. I'm going to do this. I, I'll share with it. Facebook, B Ryan, BRS, something. What's, it, what's the Facebook? Uh, oh, BRS TV guy. Yeah, I don't, I don't You're watching it, on their Facebook right now. I think it's just Ryan Bachelor, actually. Yeah. I think I changed it to just back to Ryan. Oh, yeah, Ryan Bachelor, BRS so, TV uh, investors. Follow Ryan Bachelor. I'm going to do this. I'm going to take my skimmer and just feed it into itself. I'll do it with or that way and without, and I'll share uh, the charts uh, like from my the, from the apex on how it affects the pH. You uh, could, I mean, you could be injecting, you know, just from your skimmer alone, you could be injecting CO two laden air from your house uh, here thousands of times over just be, just by drawing from the main air. So if I could reduce that, well, in in theory, unless the water is adding CO two to uh, the the skimmer air. In theory, man, like I'm going to strip out the CO2 pretty quickly just by recirculating it in mm. there, and then it won't be any more. Oh, well, there'll be some. So why do I need the media? There'll be some. I mean, your surface area of your tank and the, the collection point for CO2 and so No, but in but, the skimmer, I won't. But in the skimmer, I'm not. And in the skimmer is the number one injection point for CO2 in anyway. So this brings up actually, we're totally off track here by Cal. <laughs> so this brings up the interesting point of with the media, okay, does the media, like if I'm running my skimmer and I have zero CO2, presumably because I scrubbed it all off, is there an equilibrium between the bubbles uh, and what's in the water? And is that super low CO2 actually pulling carbon dioxide out of the water and then scrubbing it out? So is the skimmer scrubbing itself? Is, is the skimmer it doing being a that, scrubber? Or is it just stopping the prevention? This is another experiment that we actually already had planned uh, mm. to find out. Because it's kind of like there's always an equilibrium between anything, and if you leave most things long enough, they will like cross each other to create 50-50 on each side of this, and this side, each side of the bubble water interface. Well, if I can uh, reduce the amount of CO2 I'm pulling in 100 times, then uh, I plausibly I see a, a an effect on pH, a positive effect on pH. Okay, back to the greenhouse now. <laughs> so okay. you tent the refugium or so the I, scrubber. So I tent the refugium or scrubber, presumably we uh, pull out a bunch of, uh, of the CO2. The scrubber, it wouldn't work because the scrubber would then be depleted for carbon dioxide and the algae wouldn't mm. grow. The, the, the refugium, I have a, the issue, the hurdle I see is the, you know, is lighting it, uh, unless you, you'd have to develop a light that was uh, IP65 rated or whatever the rating is, because how am I going to light the dome with a light that's inside? High, assume that's going to be a high moisture content area. I got one more, uh. actually. <clears throat> what if I was just looking for a reason to uh, set up like a dart frog or terrarium or lizard tank? Oh, suck out of that thing. Yeah. So We're heavily planted to paludarium or whatever. It's a little box of presumably low carbon dioxide because there's so many plants in there. Bunch of plants. And I have my skimmer feed out of the bottom of it to <laughs> suck out all the air that's already you know stripped out from the plants. That's a good reason to get into another hobby. I know. Like I, I could put my terrarium right next to my reef <laughs> tank, then, and it could be there for a reason. Yeah. I don't know if it, the, if it would pull out air fast enough for how fast the skimmer pulls air, yeah. but wouldn't that be cool? That would be interesting. Okay, Run so it through paludarium. That is a uh, potential option. Sorry about the distraction there. <laughs> I, I got an idea. I had to run with it. Uh, okay, so 
Where are, uh, when is this a good option, a refugium or a scrubber? Yeah, I mean, anybody who wants to invest in the, uh, I mean, you have to get the sump or have the space or modify your sump like we did with the 160. Uh, the, the right lighting we found in our, all of our testing, is, the proper lighting is the best way to light the refugium where you're going to get the most effect, especially pH. Uh, and I'd go back and watch that one. Uh, that was a very convincing episode. Um, uh, or, you know, you just pick the scrubber. Like, this thing is uh, relatively inexpensive for the, what it does, uh, and it's modular. I can fit it in a lot of places. I would say, say I would recommend a, a scrubber or a refugium to anyone, anyone who's willing to buy it. Yeah. It up. Right. Anyone I mean, in there, 100%. That dual purpose of nitrate phosphate removal plus pH benefit, uh, I mean, it's worth its weight. I do the nutrient control, especially for newer reavers, number one problem. Yeah. Now, once you fill the thing with corals, nutrients usually aren't the problem. The corals suck them up. Yeah. But in a beginning stage, everybody's trying to fight off all kinds of pests and uh, like, uh, algaes and stuff. Like nutrients are the number one problem. That comes polluted tank. Everybody loves to feed in the beginning. Everybody. Yeah. Uh, so having a refugium like really, really helps for a lot, a lot of people. I'd recommend it to anybody. On my own tank, uh, the where I'd recommend the differences here is, uh, I, I don't know, whatever one speaks to you uh, or has space for. So, like, even though I have a super giant sump, there's nowhere in there to put a refugium. Yeah. So I'm going to use a scrubber. Uh, thank you, Josh, for sending me one. <laughs> uh, I will uh, tell over the world, like, how well it goes for me. This is the first time that I've actually, I've seen it done here eight million times, but I've never actually used one myself on my own tank. I will let you know how it goes. Yeah, I'm excited. All right. Similar to what we just said, another way to manage pH. They just keep coming. This, this one, one's your favorite. This one's my favorite. More coral, please. 100%. Uh, increase photosynthesis. Decrease CO2. Instead of going out and buying $5,000 worth of gear, increase pH. go buy $5,000 worth of coral. Problem <laughs> solved. Right? Yeah, because uh, the zooxanthellae of the coral suck up CO2 uh, and, uh, you know, you're increasing pH through photosynthesis. In fact, if you use scrubbers uh, to be able to get the pH, like a CO2 scrubber with media, and you get the corals to grow uh, twice as fast uh, exponentially. This is solving itself. Uh, uh, you can actually stop using the media probably in two years <laughs> rather than fight this thing waiting for five years to finally get there. Yeah. Anybody want to get to the end point two instead of five? Uh, ah, I don't it's, know. Ah, it's a marathon. Yeah. Well, what if I told you that two is actually healthier and you're more likely to get there at two than you were likely to get there at five? Well, then I do want to be there in two. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, but you might actually, the, the CO2 scrubbing media might actually be a tool that you lean on mm. to get to the destination rather than the destination itself. Yeah. Okay. The bad of more coral is the cost. <laughs> If I wanted to fill up a 120-gallon tank and uh, get there so much faster to fight this pH thing, it is going to cost me a lot of money. I got a, I got a solution, though, for that. Oh. It's a display. So future idea here. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Display fuge of rapidly growing cheap coral. People do this all the time. Uh, people do this in that they frag their corals from the front and don't have space and don't want that in the display. So you put it down in chambers of the sump, and then you light that chamber of the sump the same way you would uh, your tank. But if I have extremely fat money caps and bird's nests of the world and all of these you know, fast, fast growing uh, corals, then uh, this could probably work. What if I picked up one of those like innovative marine uh, like lagoon style style like frag tanks? You know they're kind of near, yeah, yeah. not very tall. Tie it into the and system. I filled it up with Xenia, right? So, I mean, I only have to buy one plug, and in six months, I'm going to pull anyway. <laughs> uh, so not super expensive. I fill the thing up with Xenia, and uh, I light it, and I plumb it right into the same sump. I can throw uh, like a return it, go right in the same sump, mm. and the Xenia. We we'll actually suck up all the CO2. I could even use the Xenia as a display reverse yeah. cycle. Yeah, it will, and it will suck up nutrients too. Yeah. To some degree. So there's probably like a lot of really rapidly growing corals. And when I say rapid, part of it's for CO2 absorption, but part of it's just so it's cheap too. You don't have to go out and buy 8 million acro frags <laughs> to, uh, to make that happen. I could probably do like uh, mushrooms, green it's star pops. Really fast growers. I, you know what I would actually say is probably if you were going to do this method, uh, which is just a future idea, is a coral that grows really fast and tolerates really high light with high rates of photosynthesis mm. will probably suck up the carbon dioxide from the tank the fastest. Mm. Uh, and be kind of cool. 
All right. So, uh, <laughs> when is more coral a, a good option? Oh, anytime. Everybody wants more coral. 100% of just time. keep adding more, more coral. More coral will be the solution to so many things. <laughs> you just don't know it yet. Uh, another option for uh, this that a lot of people probably haven't think about to control your pH? Lighting and tuning lighting. Now, this is uh, increasing the... Uh, potentially increasing the rate of photosynthesis or increasing photosynthesis by, you know, turning it up to a certain degree. Uh, but they could have the, I mean, there's a point of diminishing the returns where too much is uh, not a good thing. And maybe you're already riding the razor's edge, so you might have to turn the thing down to increase photosynthesis. So I, I have definitely seen this. I'm, right now what I'm doing is I let my tank run at like LPS levels just to stabilize in there. Mm. And now I'm cranking them up about 10% every week until I get to SPS levels. And I'm definitely watching the pH go up every single week as I increase the amount of photosynthetic energy that's going in this tank. And there isn't even any coral just in it. Just a bunch it. of coralline. It's the coralline algae yeah. stuff. Mm. Yeah. And so uh, you could try increasing the amount of light in there or length of photo period. But you can also try the opposite. <laughs> uh, you know, we saw with uh, Dana Riddle's uh, articles that like the highest rates of photosynthesis is actually in the morning and evening sometimes. So Lower par. You yeah. might actually find that lowering the par of your lights actually produces a higher pH in the tank because the rates of photosynthesis go up. So it's about the right number, not necessarily got to go up or down. Yeah, this is that conversation about DLI and if, uh, if uh, uh, a whole lot of par for a short period of time versus a uh, lower par for a longer period of time, if those are actually, uh, you know, transferable, if one is going to have the same effect. So one of the best ways to identify whether or not that would actually work would be to track alkalinity. Yeah, consumption so rates. if you change the lights any, uh, especially making it longer or brighter, uh, actually both ways. So if you make it longer or brighter, uh, say I made the photo period 20% longer, I should actually consume 20% more alkalinity. If I don't, the corals probably didn't like it and it might have actually gone backward. Mm -hmm. if, I increase the, uh, if I increase the light intensity 10%, my alkalinity consumption should go up 10%. I mean, these are all rough numbers and right, right, indicators. Right. Yeah. But the opposite could be true too. If I decrease the light 20%, you might actually find the alkalinity consumption goes up if you were too bright already. Yeah. Uh, and so this is the only reason I turned it down in many, or in any cases, because I had an inkling that one of these would probably work and I'd have to have an inkling because of a par number, par meter, not because I just, well, I guessed. Yeah, and by all, and really test, You're testing and testing and testing is going to be the the way to get that done. The me reason I added tuning lighting is because you should think about the thought process of the fact that the highest point of the uh, of the pH of your tank is 100% wrapped around the lighting on the front of the Middle tank. Middle of the day, yeah. It affects it more than anything else probably. So tune it and see what you do. Bad idea, or the bad part of the tuning lighting is? It messes with your stability. So you've always, and we continue to repeat this, like set your lights one time and never touch them again. Uh, you know, when you start fiddling around with intensities and fiddling around with lengths of uh, photo periods, these stressing events on corals. Yeah, uh, so in <coughs> reality, I would just tell you don't do this. Yeah. Uh, but future idea of how we could actually get to this thing is uh, I've talked to Dana and he's actually offered many times to help uh, teach, us, teach how to us how to use that PAM meter, the yeah. PAM fluorometer. Yeah. And we could actually find the ideal par, par for many species of corals, so at least like really get closer or, into the window rather than just this range like, of rather LPS than like coral. SPS, yeah, but they're all completely different. Yeah. Yeah. And then we can find out the ideal uh, areas or pockets and share them with you. So uh, hopefully that will happen in the future. Uh, so uh, when is it a good option to tune lighting to control pH? You kind of have to be on top of your game on this one, uh, riding that razor's edge. If you're willing to you know, be a pioneer in this type of uh, environment and, you know, potentially have the potential to, you know, maybe kill some corals along the way if you do this wrong. Yeah, uh, that's when it's a good option. It's probably not my first option. It's no. probably my bottom of my totem pole option. 
riding the razor's edge is a terrible idea. Uh, but understanding the mechanisms that control pH, great idea. Yeah. Okay, another one uh, is you can actually, I mean, can you be surprised? There's so many ways to control pH that people, many people just aren't thinking about. And when you combine this all together, you will solve your problem. Yes. Uh, so uh, flow, all right? You can control the flow or the direction of the flow in your tank will change the pH of your tank. This is largely how, how rapidly or violently is the surface of the yeah. water turning over. Do you have pumps that are aimed at the surface? Is it still? Is it, uh, you know? Yeah, the more, the more you're churning the water, the more, one, you know, uh, the exposure to ambient CO2 in the air and then turning that and getting the CO2 into the, uh, into the water column. Uh, Maybe not as big uh, as a change that you would get from your skimmer, uh, but it, something to consider the effect. You know, this is this funny because there's Low a lot effect of people evaporation. That, a lot sure. of people watch this thing and are like, but I thought turning over the water was good. It's gas exchange. Yeah, not when you have a CO2 laden home. Yeah, when you have uh, atmospheric CO2 in your house, which almost most of us do, if you're watching this video still long, you certainly do. <laughs> uh, and uh, you have all the CO2 in your house, <clears throat> well, turning over the water, yeah, it's great for gas exchange. But you're actually introducing the CO2 faster than ever. Driving pH down, okay. which is the antithesis of what we're trying to achieve here. Yeah, so uh, reducing surface turnover can reduce the speed at which the CO2 is transferred from the air to the water. Yeah, so you're talking about the negative, uh, doing the opposite of increasing the surface agitation is actually decreasing the surface agitation. Uh, but, you know, the, the bad part of the problem with that is it also reduces the gas exchange. And then there, here comes the film on the surface too. Yeah, so like oxygen now isn't going to be added to the tank mm -hmm. as fast. You're probably going to get, like you said, that icky film on there. Uh, so one of the things you could do though, just because this isn't that big of a stability change, mm. is you could just, if you're having this Try problem, just take the pumps and aim them down and watch your pH chart on your Apex or in your test kit or whatever it is and see. If it actually makes a, a change. Yeah, I mean, mm. Like actually, you know, I, I'm gonna make a pitch for the, uh, the Apex here for a second because every time I go to my videos and I show this on my uh, on my phone, mm -hmm. uh, on uh, Facebook, and Instagram, is I I go straight up to the Apex board and I show you a week's long worth of data. And I can tell you what I did on that day. And look, so hey, today is Monday. I turn my pumps down to reduce the surface agitation. I come back to my graph next Monday and I go. Uh, the Monday before, uh, before I was running average about here, and now here I'm running an average here. Okay, without that, all of this is garbage because there's zero chance I'm going to go walk up and document by the hour what my yeah, pH is really, off of the probe or test kit. Yeah. No, no sane person would do that. And this is one of the easiest probes to mechanism to, to measure in that, you know, put a probe in your tank. Log, log the measurements. It's constantly uh, taking yeah. measurements all the time. You know what's funny, man, is actually like well, back you know, a while back ago, people were telling me like, well, why would you want to measure pH as long as it's here in this range, everything's fine, pH is useless to me. Like, you just couldn't be more wrong. You know, like, <laughs> a, it's a really good t uh, uh, monitor to tell you about all kinds of problems that have happened with oh, the tank, oh, yeah. chemistry overdoses, imbalances, whatever, and tell you Canary. about... Canary. Yeah, it can tell you about whether or not uh, your lighting's working by pH twing. It can do so many things it can do, but also roll the corals 50% faster, thicker, stronger. Uh, because I would never, ever, ever do this with a test kit, and very, very unlikely that I would do graph it like that with a monitor. Oh yeah, I'm not, even with the, the easy- The monitor's 100 bucks anyway. Even with the easy, like, put the dip the thing in the water, get the pH, and then I'm gonna write the thing down, and then I'm gonna write the thing down, do it multiple times a day. So all, all this is really because I can walk up to the chart and just show you. Uh, so, but that with that, in that spirit, like when you have something like that, I can just go up to the change the flow. I can go up there, turn the pumps down a little bit, uh, and then just watch, note it in the chart, and just watch what happens and make informed decisions mm. from that point on. All right. This one's also pretty interesting, closely related. Oh, future ideas. Uh, considering when it's a good option? Oh, considering when this is a good option? I don't know. In most cases, I actually left this open. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know, man. I, I'm not really big on 
intentionally reducing oxygen and gas exchange with the yeah. system. You start so, to mess with uh, evaporation and uh, like, especially if it did it both on the skimmer as well as the tank. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. My, my my mind points me at like this having a negligible effect. Uh, I just I just I I think it had more of an effect than you think. But yeah. at the same time, uh, one of this is a good option. Oh, actually, there's a close one next. So the next option here, uh, right after flow, is actually a lid on the tank, which is mm. almost the same thing. Very few of you have lids, but man, do they work. Yeah, and this you know speaks to the same point where you're reducing the gas exchange. Uh, you're also reducing the evaporation, uh, but the reducing the gas exchange means less CO2 coming into your tank in the first place. Mm -hmm. So the bad part is uh, one, like we said, you're reducing the uh, the gas exchange, similar to what we said before. Uh, but the other one is blocking light, and I've I've had this conversation with multiple people before on how do lids block light. And one of the first things you point at is like, unless you were meticulous about cleaning these glass lids every single day. Uh, everybody has salt creep that uh, splashes up, and uh, now not only is the salt creep uh, preventing light and blocking light and diffusing light, uh, but with that has like uh, precipitation and precipitation buildup and blocking light. And over, I mean, well, you know, to some degree, I wonder what the droplets of water underneath do for your light in, in, in the same breath. But uh, you would have to be extremely meticulous about keeping the glass clean to not have that be a problem. After watching all of your experiments and stuff, there's no way. Uh, for just light alone, I mm. probably wouldn't do this. But yeah, you can put a lid on there, and a lid will probably change the way that the gas has gas exchange with the air, because you're trapping gas, essentially, mm -hmm. in there. Uh, future ideas, not uh, applicable here. Yeah. Uh, but when is this a good option? One of the th areas I say this is a good option uh, reminds me of the old bio cubes. Yeah, oh, that's what I wrote down here. Very small nano style tanks. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. So like the bio cube in an office, especially because mm -hmm. I had a bio cube and somebody told me this and then like I I soak it up all the way. The bio cube in an office is super awesome for two reasons. It was actually the owner of. Salt uh, Fritz over at Oh uh, Saltwater Empire. Saltwater Empire said this to me. He said, "Dude, if in an office environment, it's sweet because you evaporate about a cup of water a week." Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because uh, you're it's sealed perfect. in all of the uh, all of the moisture. You're also sealing in some of the gas exchange as well. Uh, not great if you're gonna have eight million fish in there. Uh, you're talking like this tiny little tank, so yeah. But I bet you the CO2 and the carbonic acid and the atmospheric. Uh, I just I bet you pH isn't an issue. I haven't tested this one, but I imagine you're solving two issues. So if you have like an office tank where you just really don't want to have to do a gallon, lot of work, ten gallon, it could be both of those things. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Thumbs up if you really uh, found <laughs> uh, out a lot more about pH than you thought you would today. pH matters, people. 7.8. We need to stop thinking that it's okay. All right. I got two videos to point you to that you'll see in the future. Uh, you should go check out. One of them is master pH. So if you lost us on the chemistry a little earlier, then we did it really, really well in a short video called uh, Master Your pH. We'll throw it over here. And then also, if you want to find out all that information about the calc slurry and probably why you wouldn't want to dose slurry because it's got uh, so many impurities yeah. in it, you'll find it right here. You can find out all about it. And happy holidays, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for lasting with us for an hour and 25 minutes. Oh, good one. All right. Two hours and 25 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys.